Public notice of this meeting pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act has been given to the board secretary on May 4th, 2022 in the following manner. Posted notice on the school bulletin board at the administration building transmitted to the Courier Post, Philadelphia Inquirer and the clerk of Cherry Hill Township. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Mrs. Sugars, would you please call roll? Mrs. Arroyo? Here. Mrs. Stratton? Here. Mrs. Fleischer? Here. Ms. Friedel? Mr. Mayor? Here. Dr. Rood? Mrs. Ms. Stern? Here. Mrs. Tong? Here. Mr. Avadia? Here. We will start with a board recognition and turn over to Dr. Malash. Thank you, Mr. Avadia. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm uh, glad that we are together this evening. Very excited about the recognition that we are doing this evening. Uh, and as we get ready to get started, Mrs. Wilson is going to, our public information officer, Mrs. Wilson, is going to be putting up on the screen uh, some slides for us to see about the seal of biliteracy. Uh, the seal of biliteracy is something that is relatively new in the state of New Jersey, uh, for which students have to demonstrate um, very specific abilities in order to receive this seal as they graduate from high school. Uh, and I'm incredibly proud of the performance of our students uh, and what they were able to do this year. I just want to tell you, as, and Ms. Wilson, you go ahead and, and uh, start to show um, that there are seals of biliteracy that are being awarded in Spanish in French, in Chinese, in Latin, in German, in Arabic, in Polish, and in Korean. And then we also have a number of students who received seal of biliteracy in more than one language. Um, students who received in Spanish and Korean, Spanish and French, Spanish and Russian, Chinese and French, and German and Russian. Uh, and board members, you'll notice in the Spanish and French, our very own board rep from High School East, Ariana, is up there. Exciting, right? So that demonstrates that she received the seal by literacy in Spanish and French. Doesn't even mention English, which is the primary language in which we teach in our schools. Um, so that that their performance of being trilingual. Uh, and the numbers, the highest number in literacy we had this year was Spanish with 53 students. French, we had 15 students five with Chinese, three with Latin, one with German, two with Arabic. Now we do not teach Arabic in our schools. So this is students have learned on their own outside through families, through cultural centers, two with Polish. Uh, and again, we do not teach Polish in our schools. So again, on the outside through families, same thing with Korean, um, two students with Korean and we do not teach that or offer that within the schools. So all of our students will get a certificate um, that, that we have, we'll send them over to the schools uh, that recognizes them for achieving that seal of biliteracy. And then when they graduate with their diplomas, uh, they will also see that as well. So once again, congratulations to all of these students. We are incredibly proud of the work that they have done. Thank them for their dedication. Thank the staff members for their support uh, in what the students have done getting to this level. And again, one more round of applause for our own Ariana. Thank you, Mr. Vadia. Thank you, Dr. Malash. We have no presentations or administrative reports this evening. Um, this brings us to correspondence. Is there any correspondence that board members would like to share this evening? So, okay, Mr. Mayor. 
So um, I didn't, I wasn't able to attend um, as much as I, I would have liked to, but I was happy to attend two of the meetings that we've had, um, goals meetings that we had with families. Um, what I, my biggest takeaway from those two meetings was um, the, uh, the fact that the families involved were uh, quite supportive of the district's efforts um, and this, the, uh, the staff efforts and um, expertise in, in, in uh, moving their children forward. So that's always good to hear. Um, I'm looking forward uh, the later this week to attending um, the AAPI Heritage um, uh, Celebration and also um, an opportunity to participate in the webinar um, for the support of uh, wellness for AAPI students and also the um, star games which are taking place weather permitting apparently that's a little bit of a question mark so hopefully that won't be a problem looking forward to the star games um, on friday as well thank you mr mayor turn to ms stern next so i had a chance to attend the cum laude society induction ceremony at east on may 4th and not to be outdone by Mr. Avadi, I had to bring in my uh, prop here. <laughs> so this was the um, uh, program for the, the evening. Um, so the Cum Laude Society had a whole lot of students in it. It was pretty impressive. Uh, juniors and seniors that were inducted. So um, they were the students who are either in the top 20% of their class or top 10%, which is really pretty hard to achieve. Um, I think in any high school, um, and I mean, certainly, I think it is at East, um, the Cum Laude Society um, values excellent on, honor, excellence, honor, and justice, which I thought was pretty cool, uh, pretty neat. And um, there were also three faculty who were inducted. Um, so Mrs. Carly Friedman, who is, I believe, a guidance counselor. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, Mrs. Ann McCaffrey. Um, who is an English teacher. Thank you. I just want to clarify, I get this right. Um, and Mrs. Heather Vaughn, who is a teacher um, in English and secondary music, English, I guess, primary. So anyway, it was a great event. It was very um, nicely done and very impressive. And uh, it was a great group of kids. Um, for me, it was pretty nice because these are this is the graduating class of my son's own class. So I knew a lot of the kids on stage. So it was pretty cool to see them. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Mrs. Fleischer next. Thank you very much. Um, I had the honor actually, this past Sunday was a, an amazing event. It was the Ar author and artist and author expo. It's a little mouthful. Um, it was uh, actually at Croft Farm and it was sponsored by Chaka, the Cherry Hill African American Civic Association. And um, actually our own Tina Truitt in the district, um, she has written many books. So I actually um, was able to buy one of her math books for my nieces and that was great. Um, and it was a wonderful uh, way to see like um, everyone uh, out and about. And we also, they also had the, uh, the Art Expo, I forget, uh, uh, Cherry Hill Blooms um, at uh, there. And then I think that's still available for people to see. And um, I also attended a Garden State Coalition schools meeting and um, went to Mr. East at East High School, which is something that they've had since the 80s. My son actually competed um, this year, so it was very fun. But uh, it was great to see all the kids and it's sort of a fun you know, a fun thing. They just sort of, you know, have fun and, and do dances and, you know, the teachers and advisors um, in all of our schools, but just seeing it that night, the amount of work that went into that night for the advisors, I'm truly grateful for everyone uh, being so hardworking. So that's it for me. Thank you. All right, I'll go next. Um, I also went to artists and authors and it was a lovely event. Um, I, I, I brought the rain, so sorry about that for anyone who attended, but uh, nonetheless, a uh, beautiful event. Um, SpongeBob the Musical, so, you know, West uh, performed SpongeBob. It's quite a, quite a packet, um, and it was lovely. Uh, I was there for opening night for Dr. Melange. Um, a lot of talent. I brought my, um, 
my four-year-old that was just delighted. And we've, we've been singing it ever since. So sort of an addicted, there probably should have been like a little bit of a warning. Um, but the way they opened the second act with the pirate song, just, you know, just warmed my heart. And it was uh, really just lovely. The other thing is flying students. So I did not realize we had flying students, but we do. Um, and uh, thank goodness everyone is safe. Uh, so I didn't hear any reports otherwise, at least. So a lot of flying through the air, uh, which was nice. They didn't offer audience demonstrations. Um, the second thing is I learned more than I ever knew about volleyball on Saturday when East and West competed. Um, and I, I also learned that um, unlike the Olympics, it is three, um, three sets. So I, I not only um, what I intended to, which was to go to the varsity game, um, you know, where, where I will say that East was, um, you know, did prevail in the end. Um, but I also was there for the JV game, um, both very, very well, well done. You know, East did take both. I, I do have to say, once I learned what the sport was and how they scored it and how they displayed the scores and what they all meant, I did determine that East, you know, took, took it away. Um, however, you know, a lot of, lot of energy, um, you know, a lot, lot of people who were very excited. I did something silly, but I won't tell you about it. Um, <laughs> But uh, the staff was very happy to assist me in my uh, absolute stupidity. But anyway, so uh, enjoyed uh, enjoyed both varsity and JV. It was it was very well done. It was a little sad that some of the stuff got rained out, but a lot of it will be rescheduled, um, and so hopefully we'll have a chance to have a board presence at the um, the other game. So that's all for me. I'm going to turn it back to Ms. Stern here. Thank you. And just one more um, activity that I got to be uh, involved with was actually it went to the World Championship competition for robotics. That, which was the East Robotics Club. Um, uh, East had two teams that went to this in Dallas, Texas. There were 813 teams there from around the world. Um, Azerbaijan, Mexico, um, South Korea, just countries, literally people from all over the world, New Zealand um, that were competing in this competition. And the two teams that went, one was a senior team and one was a sophomore team. So they have lots of time ahead of them. And um, East uh, was over, held over two and a half days and East, um, the teams both got into the qualifying, they went through the qualifying rounds and got into the um, quarterfinals, at which point their robots lost. Um, but it was, it, was, it was pretty neat. I mean, it was, to me is the kind of the ultimate connecting beyond the classrooms. These are students who have, you know, um, the social and uh, emotional experiences, but uh, a lot of learning, a lot of academics. Most of these seniors are going on to study, um, you know, top engineering um, and the things that they really learned through the club. So it was pretty, pretty amazing to see East represent well. And they connected with a Hawaii team who they know. I mean, they know these kids because they've been in contact with them through the years through this club. So pretty neat stuff so and just nice to see all those kids together um after all this time although it was really loud and there were a lot of people there but other than that it was pretty neat so okay thanks all that will bring us to first public comment um for which i have a short speech there will be two opportunities for public comment this evening this first public comment session is for board action agenda items only. There will be another public comment section for any topic at the end of the meeting. If you are a student in the district, you may comment on any item during the first public comment period. Please identify yourself as a student. Now online, what I would like you to do, uh, because I do not have, um, well, I would just be very helpful. If you and indicated before your name in S, like a lowercase S, just so I, you know because maybe people spell Sam with two S's, I don't know. Um, okay, moving on. If you would like to speak now, please identify the agenda item and clearly state your name and municipality. We do not need your, uh, your street address. We will alternate between speakers here in the room and those that are online. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak. The timer on the screen will indicate the amount of time you have remaining. Cherry Hill is a community that values education and educational topics often bring out a passionate response. The Cherry Hill Board of Education supports a school climate in which our diversity is a source of strength and all are included. Respect is foundational in how we treat you, how we treat each other, and how we support our administration and staff in their essential work. Please join us in practicing the utmost respect for all. And I will begin in the room as I so often do. And the floor is yours to start with name and municipality. All right. Um, 
Jack Neary, uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, it was the equity audit, right? That's the thing that I forget the name for the word, the equity audit, right? That's from this. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so I just want to say with special needs equity, there can be some improvements from definitely from past years and whatnot. Um, my eighth grade year, I was, my teachers felt I was more than capable of taking algebra one, but they did not recommend me because of the fact they did not think I was able to be supported as properly in algebra one. And due to that fact, I ended up taking what I guess one would say the standard for eighth grade. Um, but with that being said, from what I've heard, or at least what I've seen personally, with students who have IEPs and stuff, they per se, trying to figure out how to word this properly. <laughs> um, sorry, just give me a moment. All right, thank you. Here we go. Okay. Basically, every time a student does super successful, has an amazing year, usually with the IP, they think they'll just take away the IP because they will continue on with that success. But sometimes what usually will end up happening is that student ends up flunking the year after they have their IEP because they no longer have those supports that were in place, allowing them to thrive as well as they did. And with that, like with my COVID, well, with the year in COVID, I did not do as well because some of the supports that I had were not able to be as easily accommodated due to the COVID. I've known other students who had their IEP taken away and they totally flunked. And as soon as they got them back, they did a lot better. To me, I think at least the Board of Education sort of views are, well, I don't know who is in control of the IEPs, views the... Um, IEPs more as per se training wheels. And once they sort of master how to ride the bike, they take them off. But to some special education students, it's more or less like a wheelchair. They have that and allows them to thrive. It allows them to move around and get to where they need to go and be able to succeed as well as they do. That is all, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. So I'm going to look online and I see no hands raised back in the room and that will therefore, oh, no, we do have uh, someone on the line. Would, would you not, be, nope. Okay, um, we'll give Mujnabin a moment. We will have a second public comment period. Um, okay, I think, we, I think we've lost. Uh, him or her. So, um, nope, Mujnabin Ibn Akbal. Um, okay, your hand is raised and the floor is yours. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, um, why we should have a break for Eid al Fitr? So, um, Eid celebrates the fasting that is done. Can you huh? start with your your name and municipality? Um. What? Can you start with name and municipality, and then if you're a student, and if not, uh, an item. Oh yeah. Sorry. Um. My name is Mujnabin Ibn Iqbal, and I'm a student. Um. And uh, what does ethicality mean? Uh, as a student, uh, Cherry Hill is your municipality. So you're, you're, you're good to keep going. Okay, so um, Eid celebrates the fasting that is done in Ramadan. Eid is, very, is a very important festival for us Muslims. And a day off on those three days would be appreciated. Just like for Christmas, New Year's, and President's Day, we should have a day off. The three days is all I ask for. Having a three-day break can help with reducing stress at school. And Muslims go and celebrate 
this festival by donating to charity, eating, and visiting family. So, if we don't have school during those days, then we Muslims will be able to do our tradition and the other students and staff will also be able to have a break. It is like winter break and spring break, but shorter. Having this three-day break can also be useful by letting students have some thinking time or some time to catch up on schoolwork. And, and that is all. Thank you very much. All right, back to the room, back to online, and that will end our first public comment period. Uh, thank you to the two students. And that will move us to our board work session. Oh, that means I will turn it over to Mrs. Sugars to take us through the, the start of that. So you will see on your agenda this evening on May 24th, um, that will be our reorganization meeting. Um, and so um, you will see here, and I'm sure that um, Ms. Stern will talk about it a little bit more during her report out, uh, because we reviewed this with the BNF committee last week. Um, we typically go through a reorg um, in May to prepare us for the upcoming school year. This kind of goes back to when school board elections were held in April. Um, we do a small reorganization now in January uh, to swear in our new board members um, since our uh, elections moved to November. Um, but we, in this section here, you'll see at the next board meeting, we will appoint um, personnel within the district. We will appoint professional services. Uh, we will appoint uh, business type uh, office, business office type things such as approving um, transfers between board meetings and paying of bills um, and various other things uh, in this section that will set us up and get us ready for the upcoming school year. Are there any questions about this section of the agenda? We will then turn it over to Mrs. Arroyo to discuss curriculum and instruction. Thank you. So I um, have a lot of notes and I try to minimize them and it didn't work out for me. So we, <laughs> it's like three pages. Um, so we met uh, the other week and we had a full agenda and one of the, we had a, a couple presentations. Um, and the first one was going over the social studies curriculum revisions, which is um, a, on a five-year cycle, am I correct? Um, and I don't wanna do it injustice because I know there was a lot of detail. So I'm gonna kick it over to Dr. Mahan if you could. <laughs> um, I have the presentation I think that we have and I'll chime in because. The presentation was given by uh, Ms. Violeta Katsikis and Ms. Mrs. Allison McCartney, both curriculum supervisors. They are working on the social studies curriculum revisions that need to be implemented for the 2022-2023 school year. The revisions cover all of the standards with most of the revisions occurring in K to five and six through eight. The presenters talk specifically in regards to the implementation of the new civics course at the middle school level as well as the implementation of um, New Jersey legislation that includes um, persons with disabilities and those who identify with the LGBTQ community. This was just an appetizer for the next presentation that will occur in June, where the committee members for the social studies committee will come and speak to members of the CNI committee and discuss with them the product and resources that we will be using to support the implementation of the full social studies curriculum. Ms. Katsikis and Ms. McCartney also included a timeline for implementation, which supports the curriculum revision and curriculum implementation cycle that we have, uh, that we utilize for all content areas in the district. Ms. Arroyo. Thank you. You're welcome. Just making sure I don't have anything else. Okay, so then the next part, um, the next section we talked about was the high school uh, reading requirements and the four additional books that were added. 
Um, and those are, I have them. Again, leaving my. So we included the Joy Luck Club and Fences. I believe that's for 10th grade, 11th grade. 11th uh, grade is fences. Yes, their eyes uh, were watching God, and that's for 11th grade. 11th grade. Thank you. You're See, welcome. Keep teamwork. going. We're a good team. Teamwork. <laughs> um, and namesake. I believe that's it. Seniors. For seniors. Yeah. So um, yeah. some of the text, the texts were replaced based on making sure that the students had more of a diverse um, set of authors to read from and also a lot of feedback from the students to want to be able to see themselves in the authors that they're reading um, and some of the storyline, not storylines, but just like being reflected as characters in the books. Um, so over the summer, they're going to be preparing um, and working together, providing um, professional development for, for the teachers that will be implementing um, and providing updated curriculums and everything. So I, I, I enjoyed when we read these before, some of these texts. So um, I'm excited to see how this is incorporated into the school district, into the school year. Um, Mrs. Aurora, the yes, only addition is the house on Mango Street. Oh yes, for ninth grade students. Thank you. You're welcome. That was a summer read before, right? I had that. We had that as a summer read. The yes. Other year. Yes. Um, and then health education updates. Um, I know. I think it was April 13th that Governor Murphy requested for it to be reviewed um but i think local districts if i have it right that they can adopt as how how is that like adopt as like they can select topics yeah um and they're still working that out and see what that looks like and um parents if if they're not comfortable with their students um participating in the classes they can opt out and a letter will be we confirmed in the discussion that a letter will be sent out um, to those parents, to all parents, and seeing if they want to have their student participate in the in the curriculum, but we'll know more as they um, implement that throughout the summer. You're already working on that, though, correct? We have not started working on it yet. What we have done is advertise for a curriculum committee across the grade span, so a K five committee, a six eight committee, and a nine twelve committee to implement the standards or to update our curriculum to reflect the new revised standards. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and another uh, part of the conversation was the Hanover Research um, update. So they are doing in-depth interviews with some of the survey representatives um, or survey response respondents um, to get more information on some of the areas that could be um, any opportunity gaps. CPS will be reviewing their five-year plan um, and it, based on the, I guess, the results of the data that was presented, there might be some additional goals they're adding to their current goals. And they're, you know, re, I guess not reevaluating, but more so at, just make, taking a look at membership of CPs and adding more people if needed or changing that up a bit. Um, so they'll be focused on that and on that information. What we talked about or some of the added conversation was if we should incorporate some of that data into the other committees like PNL to make sure that we're crossing over that information um, as we review like code of conduct and things like that. Um, and I know um, Dr. Rood asked if there was a way to create additional reports and that that's a yes um, because that it's our it is our data. Um, and I believe the dashboard is only available for as long as we have the contract, correct? That's correct but we are still able to access the information if we need to add additional reports to kind of fill in to see if we have any additional opportunity gaps that we need to see addressed. So as CPS goes, you know, continues to develop and then we look at our other policies and how it, how it focuses on that. I'm hoping some of the curriculum updates that we've been seeing will start addressing some of those things. Um, some of the things that we saw presented to us. So I feel like we're going in the right direction. Just this information gives us a little bit more direction um, and a little bit more focus in some in certain areas. One of the questions um, that Ms. Friedel brought up was um, concerns about the underrepresentation of, of specific populations in honors or AP classes, specifically um, students with IEPs. So that you know that was that was conversation that'll be ongoing. Um, 
I think that's it for that one. And then Dr. Morton talked about um, updates on school start times. So he gave an update on the thought exchange and then um, that they will be expanding the committee, the start school start times committee to include parents um, and representatives from the elementary schools so that we have um, more just an overview, especially now with the pending legislation um, on high school start time change. Um, so we're gonna take some more time to review that and then hopefully have a recommendation back by January, 2023. So Dr. Morton will have um, an, you know, a new timeline based on um, this new committee coming together with this additional information. I think that's, that's it right on. Thank you. That's, that was a lot. So any questions going current? Not questions, but just um, two clarifying points that from that meeting is that, um, you know, the, the committee asked the administration if, if there was a clear plan for the health and phys ed standards and for the um, school start as we proceed. And it should be noted that this the district has a plan in place for the, the health and phys ed, and they have a process that they're going to go through in terms of creating a curriculum that's in alignment with the state standards and also in alignment with what we, we can do or have done in the past. Um, to ensure that everybody gets the same ability to opt out. And mm -hmm. I, I just want that to be said that so parents know there's nothing that's been changed as yet. They have a full process in place be, to make that be set in September. Um, and then the same with the school start times that we've done some great steps so far. Um, however, we, we're, we don't want to do unnecessary work with the state coming out with different laws and regulations, but um, just wanted to point out that uh, Dr. Morton has, has been working with that crew of students that uh, so passionately, you know, advocated for things and made sure that that we we don't uh, overpromise mm -hmm. and and under uh, what is, what is it overpromise under deliver. <laughs> so yeah, but just making sure we're managing expectations so they know that we're it's it's all a process, but we're definitely not letting it fall off. Definitely, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a question. It might go more for Dr. Malash, um, because Rosie, you, uh, Ms. Soraya, you sort of said it um, in general. I know that the state is actually taking steps for this um, health and physical education curriculum. And I know also what, am, am I correct in saying whatever they actually approve is sort of a guideline for us? Is that, it, I know that that might not be the word, but can you explain a little bit more about what your understanding of their timeline and how we need to incorporate that into what our you know new curriculum would be? So the, the state releases the standards, right? And then the expectation is that the local districts then build the curriculum around what those standards are. Children are expected to meet the standards in certain age and grade bands, um, but it's local control about how we meet those and, and what that looks like going in. There's been a lot of discussion out there statewide um, about the, the shift in standards uh, and honestly about some uh, specific sample lessons that were provided. Um, all, you know, and, and I've seen some of them with what was released that people have talked about. Those are samples, those are not requirements, right? It comes back into the local district. Um, Dr. Mahan and Dr. Morton uh, and the, the team of teachers that will work on the curriculum, how it's presented, what's presented, you know, in what way um, will be very specific, um, you know, thoughtful, reflective, what's it gonna look like, what's it gonna feel like for the kids? Um, how do we notify parents ahead of time? You know, the, the notification process that we've used with family life curriculum is pretty well developed in town, you know, where the information goes out at the beginning of each year. Um, it is one of the, one of a couple of things uh, the parents have the right to opt out of, um, you know, during the, 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 during their child's education, where the majority of everything else, if they're in school, right, that's part of what we do. Um, so as the information changes, as curriculum is presented, it'll come to the board, we will, we don't want there to be any mystery about what it is that's going to be shared, right? Our, our goal, uh, and people throw the word transparency around a lot. Uh, when it comes to curriculum, curriculum should always be transparent, right? There should never be a mystery about what's being taught, you know, what that looks like. So uh, I expect that late in August, um, where we'll have information will be shared publicly, you know, and what that looks like and, and what will take place. will most likely be an update at the August CNI um, committee meeting. Uh, but I expect later in August, we have something we'll be able to go public and we'll be able to release information to families once school starts uh, come September. 
Great, thank you. And I, I also understand that there is possibly a bill up in New Jersey about um, putting the curriculum online 14 days before school starts. I think that that's one of the bills that was introduced that I know it, it, they just got back into session or they're getting back into it. I think they just did. Um, so it will be interesting to see what happens on the state level. It is. And, and you know, I mean, we're, it's the, the second week in May, right? And we're going to, there's a lot's going to happen between now and the end of June. And it'll be really quiet for a while and then stuff will have to come back up again next year. Um, we are following, you know, Mrs. Uh, Wethington through PNL, um, you know, and, and through the context that we use, there's a number of pieces of legislation that we're following, some that are farther along in the process, um, whether they actually come up for a full vote, uh, you know, and then what will happen with the governor, you know, to go through. But there's, there's a lot right now that, that's in there. Um, so, yes, uh, as we get information, we will certainly share that out. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you for a very thorough report. I felt like <laughs> I didn't miss anything by not being at the meeting. Um, so two things, just question for you. Do you, do you know, is there a timeline for, cause I mean, might've been mentioned before, but I don't recall for the CP reorganization in terms of like this, what's anticipated structure to kind of revive it's, it's. We didn't discuss a specific timeline. Oh, we didn't discuss a specific timeline. Um, I'm not sure. Yes. Thank you. So the C piece um, will, the entire group will, they met today. The entire group will meet again in June to talk about the structure uh, and some of the changes to the structure, but the C piece group is still, still continues to meet. That has not stopped. They met today. Just to clarify, Mrs. Wellington, follow-up question. Um, was that, cause I know it's a smaller group this year. Is it the smaller group that met or because it was the entire group that met from no, that was so, previous from last year. So let me clarify. I think there's a lot of confusion. The CPs group still exists. The group still meets with Dr. Williams to deliver content. That has not changed. They met today, the 40, 50 plus group. What has changed is part of their work was also the five-year plan, which our smaller group is going to pull together look at that aligned with the handover recommendations, try to marry those documents, and then go back to the larger group to say, here's what we came up with. Let's talk about how we move forward. Okay, that's great, thank you. Okay. Thank you. And then Mrs. Array, one more question. You, you mentioned that Mrs. Friedel raised the topic of higher level classes for students who have IEPs and 504s, which was something that came out of the research, that the initial presentation. As we go into just working on district goals, is that something that the committee wanted us to take a look at in terms of incorporating or perhaps something? I mean, we could we could definitely add that in there for conversation um, and definitely dig deeper into what, you know, she had, what kind of prompted that and what, what part of the data kind of led her in that direction to have that. So I think it's something definitely we should consider as we move forward towards that. I didn't get to be a part of the first discussion um, so I don't know where we're at with that in this extent of, of that day, that conversation that day. Oh, okay. And maybe as I'm thinking it through and hearing you talk about it, maybe because we're going to have a CNI retreat, perhaps mm -hmm. that's the best place to kind Mostly, of. That's, that would be a better place yeah, to, to, start, at least to start off the gotcha. conversation. Ms. Friedel brought that up. And then Dr. Root also brought up some additional concerns that, you know, I'd, ha I'd prefer to have him kind of represent those um, because I didn't write that down clearly. Um, and that way we'll just kind of like put it all out there and see where, what formulates from it. That's great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Open. Thank you, Mrs. Arroyo. Great report. <clears throat> the two things I just wanted to, <clears throat> to mention is I think for the board, if I recall our, our first discussion on Hanover, I think we want to dig into the data that exists. And I think that our ask of administration was, as you dig through the data deeply, what is it telling you? So what it told me, for instance, is that, you know, we have students that generally are advancing a grade level, um, but there are some issues that are not getting resolved within K to 12, depending on how people come in. Now, that's what it told me. But I think as we looked around with board members, there was a lot of understanding the data now, knowing that we're not going to be driving reports, that we wanted to see more. Now, on top of that, and I think separate from that, I think we authorize, we, we want to see this root cause analysis, right? So we know what the data means, but why, right? I mean, that's not going to tell us by itself. So that's a, 
a different mode of work. But I, I guess for me, my encouragement to your, you know, to the committee is is to really keep this top of mind because I really feel like we're either talking about it all the time or not. Um, and I think I think so. I think it was a great meeting. I just would want to see it, you know, continue and just get more of that scaffolding piece. Um, and then the school start time. I think like the, you know, the, the timeline I think is fine if we're headed toward a singular recommendation. So if, if we're, you know, essentially, I don't know, eight months out, seven months out, um, you know, at least the town hall was very compelling in terms of what the community thought we should do. If the, if the thought exchange, I wasn't part of the presentation, but if the thought exchange was in the same accord, I think we need to sort of look at a singular model and the problems with it, because every model is going to have problems. Uh, and if that's the work, that's great. And I think that will shift into goals, but I don't know that it's a goals discussion so much as if you're saying, look, this is what happens and here's where, I think it just becomes something that plugs into the goals that we have, you know, that, that we established as a district. So I think both things are great to move forward and, you know, just please with the progress, but I think, you know, the more explicit we can be always the better. I just want to um, caution that if we're asking for specific data that it's intentional and it's attached to something that we we need to see for a reason not that we don't need to like i would love if we saw all the data all the time like but it's overwhelming unless you attach it to a specific intent to the work that's happening or work you want to see happen so as you look through it and and you know just reflect back on that presentation ensure that's attached to a goal that you would like to see happen um, or achieved through some form it just to be a little bit more intentional in that conversation i don't i don't like data for the sake of data and it's it's you know we'll we'll be overwhelmed with information without a direction, um, or too many directions and like too many ways to go for something. So and then the high school start the start times, um, I the responses were um, and Dr. Morton, you, I, if I don't explain this correctly, please um, chime in. But elementary school, some of the feedback that we got was like that needed to go earlier in the day. Um, and then high school later in the day, middle school shifted. Um, that changes everything. The alignment, like it, it impacts so many other things, which is why that time period is needed to now address that. And then not doing all the work prior to if it, whether that legislation passes or not, it's just being prepared for if it, if it does. And if it doesn't, and we're already addressing it, we're prepared to move our district in a direction no matter what. Um, and who knows what that'll be, but still at least we have a process in place for it. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? All right, Ben. Great, thank you. Uh, next, we will turn it over to BNF and Mr. Okay, so we met, um, the BNF committee met on May 3rd. And um, as Mrs. Sugars uh, preluded for us a little bit ago, we had a discussion and a review of the, um, a preview of the, the reorg meeting, which we'll have, which is um, just a full review and approval of all of our appointments, um, our, many of our contracts, um, our professional appointments, et cetera. So um, uh, we, our food service appointment, um, our financial, the, the folks who do our financial um, reviews, um, our uh, attorney representation, <laughs> um, our, um, you know, just, you know, our bus contracts that exist currently, um, although sometimes there are rolling contracts that come in based on different needs, um, as well as just approving the positions that um, our different uh, staff serve. So, you know, people who have different responsibility, multiple responsibilities. Um, and, and so pretty much, you know, it, it's a pretty big, uh, big, um, thing to tackle, but we're going to, you know, just approve all of them. And, and I think one of the pieces that Mrs. Sugars, um, reminded us or educated us on is that many of our contracts are reviewed every three to five years, just out of good practice. Good. Um, it's just, it's just good, you know, a good practice to have. Um, and that, in fact, we, you know, over the years, we have made changes to some of our appointments. We changed our architective record a few years ago. Um, we just want to kind of make sure we're always getting the right fit um, and best professional services we can. So, um, and uh, there will be other, like we said, um, there'll be other um, uh, bids that go out over time. Um, but um, generally, you know, this is 
you know, most of them will be in this reorg meeting. Um, and uh, looking through the notes specifically, um, Mrs. Sugar has reviewed purchasing agent or Title IX officer. Um, uh, the, some of the district policies and regulations will be reaffirmed during this meeting um, and educational services will be approved. So um, just a whole lot of things going on, bank signatories, um, health benefit providers, all that kinds of stuff. Um, so it's going to be a big, uh, big meeting and, and we'll ho hopefully do it in one fell swoop unless there's any concerns or questions about it. Um, and uh, uh, one of the questions about one of these items was, from um, Mrs. Fleischer, and she specifically asked about the um, the contract with the Bruno Associates, who um, does our uh, the grant writer. Thank you. <laughs> it was a grant. Writer. I don't know why I've been waking up at five thirty every day when I don't need to, but I have been. So, I'm trying to make sure I'm, I'm fresh tonight. Um, and so that RFQ um, will go out again in uh, before July. So um, some of the, again, that's part of the contracts that are kind of almost like rolling at different times. So any questions about that? Or I guess I should go on to, I'll do the full report, sorry, and then, I'll, then we'll come back to any questions. Um, so the other topic we discussed um, was just review. Um, we had a, the Neil Workett and Rakesh uh, Darji from uh, ERI came in, Environmental Resolutions Incorporated, um, to give us, just to help discuss and explain how we address ADA issues and we ensure compliance with our ADA regulations, how they're monitored. Um, and I, you know, I think many of you know, ERI did a full assessment of our um, entrances to all our buildings, which they actually said was, I think the most comprehensive assessment they've ever done for a school district, you know, to that degree, because of all our buildings. Um, and from that compiled a priority list of um, ADA compliance projects to make sure that um, as we renovate our buildings um, and areas of our buildings that we get more and more in compliance, which we need to be, um, and that's a priority. So, you know, how do we, you know, incorporate that into all the projects that we're doing? Um, and they've helped us determine that. And um, so there was further discussion about some of the questions of, you know, when there's you know, an error made, let's say we were, went into great detail about um, asphalt versus concrete. Concrete's more reliable in terms of when it sets, it's more accurate in terms of the original grade, whereas asphalt might have more give, as I guess my layman's understanding of it. And Joel, uh, Mr. Mayor and Mrs. Fleischer, you can, if I got it wrong, you can <laughs> chime in on that. Um, but <laughs> But, you know, and, and there have been some, you know, errors over time, even in the, our modern, the more recent work we've done, there's been some errors and they've had to be corrected. Um, and that's just, you know, kind of part of what happens during uh, work and with contracts, et cetera. Um, so, you know, that we were really, you know, talked in depth about how do we know that there's assurance that that's, those are really being, you know, complied with and prioritized. So. Uh, apparently, um, finding accurate people to do striping in parking lots is, is challenging in New Jersey. Um, companies make a lot of errors. A lot of companies make a lot of errors. So um, we've struggled with that as well as a district, but um, we were assured that, you know, there's a very high level of attention to detail from ERI and they're, they're, they made reference to, you know, taking one of their supervisors off a project on 295 to come look at one of our projects just to ensure that we, you know, it was, everything was in compliance that they, they have a heightened awareness that they want to make sure that our projects are really on track. Um, so um, there was a lot of detail discussed, but basically that's kind of the overview about all the projects. Um, so we have some upcoming ADA projects um, that they're going to be done. Um, so um, there was a, a, a complaint that was filed with the office of, oh my gosh, I'm going to get this wrong. Mrs. Sugar, our CEO. Oh, awful civil rights, thank, thank you. So um, we discussed the fact that the, sat the complaint was satisfied. Um, the, the, the Office of Civil Rights is satisfied with our, with our solution, with our upcoming projects. They're going to resolve some of the complaint um, that, was, that was raised. Um, and so we're going to be having work done this summer. Um, and um, that's going to, let's see, I want to make sure I get this right. 
I might have to have Mrs. Sugars weigh in, but I hopefully won't have to bother you. We're, we're um, bidding on projects for ADA um, improvements at Payne. Um, actually, I guess that started last week. The bids went in out last week um, or opened last week. And um, the money is budgeted, although I've, it's, it was been eight, it's been 18 months since we budgeted the monies for this. So there may be some um, expectation that with all the changes and the inflation, there's probably going to be increased costs related to these projects. Um, so I, I think I captured most of that. Um, upcoming work in the 2022-2023 school year, specifically for ADA projects, will be at Stockton Elementary and also the this building, the Malberg slash Lewis administration building. I think I got that. We had one public comment um, and the member uh, of the public asked about uh, the appointment of the ADA officer for the district and commented on the timeline for completing the projects. Uh, the community member um, asked about kind of prioritization. So, you know, one of the parking lots that we did um, due to drainage issues at, at Beck and also access to the, um, to, uh, the, the trash, uh, bin, um, I'm having trouble. <laughs> it's not a trash bin. It's the, um, dumpster. Oh my gosh. Sorry. Thank you for helping me out for the dumpster. Um, we, we paved that lot so that we could ensure that there was better access for that, but, um, we did, we did not complete the rest of the projects that are up and coming. Um, and the community member felt like there should have been more priority to the ADA accessibility that, that is up and coming. So. Questions, comments? Mr. Mayor. So I, I just wanna add uh, just a little more detail on um, the ERI presentation. Um, and you um, spoke to one of their one of their supervisors being pulled off of a big project 295 to come take a look at what was happening in one of our schools um, that was um, as i understood part of a recognition that eri has of the importance of being on top of as much as possible the ongoing work that we have going on at the various schools they do that um, in order to assure as best as possible that errors don't occur um, but knowing that sometimes they do with the subcontractors, the earlier that they can uh, observe the potential error, the earlier that can be remedied, um, remedied more quickly. Um, and regardless of the timing at which they're able to intervene to make corrections if necessary, those costs are not passed on to the district. They're not passed on to taxpayers here in Cherry Hill. Um, if there's an error, um, that uh, ultimately is the responsibility of the contractor or subcontractor. Um, but ERI was clear about um, their, their understanding of the value of maintaining as much um, correspondence and communication and being on site as often as possible um, in order to best assure that those things don't happen. Uh, and that was good to hear. Um, because at the end of the day, we want these projects to be done on the timeline that we expect, timeline that's been contracted for. Um, and even though a, a cost overrun won't be on our taxpayers, um, it's, it's still something that we want, we want to avoid as much as possible. So I thought that was, that was, uh, that was good to hear. Um, so that I thought I just wanted to add that little detail. Thank you, that was really helpful and, and clarifying. Other comments or questions? I don't know, Mrs. Fleischer, also if you have anything to add from the meeting or any other, um, Mrs. Arroyo. I just have um, two questions. The ERI, um, their information is still based on that one report they gave us. So they're just going, they're continuing that. Okay, just want to make sure. Yes, and, and then in conjunction with Mrs. Sugars and the district and, and the board's approval, that's how ultimately the decisions are being made. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. What is a resiliency officer? Yes, please. Yes, please, Dr. Mullen. <laughs> <Jump in. laughs> uh, the resiliency officer is somebody that's, a, it's one of our campus police officers that's appointed, Mr. Saparito, I'm looking out, for the internal affairs. Uh, Dr. Malach, it's, for, it's uh, for the health and welfare of campus police. For the health and welfare of the campus police. The attorney general uh, mandates that each police department in the state of New Jersey 
appoint a resiliency officer to be available if there's any sort of issues with the officers if they want to go to somebody non supervisory with. So it's a it's a peer officer within the department. It's a requirement from the attorney general's office uh, to help support the health and welfare of the other officers. Um, again, our, our nine campus police officers, we have an official, it's a, we are an official police department, just like the municipality has a police department. So we have to follow the same guidelines um, that come from the attorney general's office. Um, so the, the person who's listed in there is one of our campus police officers. Mr. Mayor, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, just, just a little bit. Um, I'm actually in the process of uh, becoming certified as a resiliency trainer for police officers and frontline, um, not just police, but all frontline EMTs. Um, resilience, resi resiliency officers primarily are there to support the, the needs of the frontline officers here. It would be the, the campus police in Cherry Hill, but that goes beyond just those nine officers. It's also staff um, that those officers interact with, students that the officers interact with, interact with um, the training that they have is specialized and allows them to more um, readily communicate um, and, and discuss issues which may be more difficult and sensitive. Um, so, so they require some additional training um, and the support that they are able to provide allows the officers to do their jobs every day um, more, uh, more easily. It's not an easy job. Um, but to also allows the officers to be able to interact um, more comfortably with students, with the staff. Ultimately, it's for the benefit of, of everybody that the officers come into contact with every day. It's not just supporting the officers and their, their needs and stresses that, um, that, that police officers, whether they're campus officers um, or they're uh, officers in, in other departments, are confronted with every day that are, that are different in many, many ways. Than, than stressors that uh, that other professors have to professors um, other professions uh, endure on a daily basis. Thank you. That's great, Mrs. Arroyo. And a right to know officer. Again, Dr. Malash, if you want to take that. Yes. Uh, you want to, I'm going to actually have Mrs. Sugars explain it. So there's a certain amount of training that we have to do, um, primarily with um, our custodial staff, sometimes uh, with our science staff in the handling of chemicals. Um, so that has to be done. We have to have a certain person that's appointed to oversee that piece. Thank you. That's all I had. Okay, great. Any last question, Mrs. Fleischer, comments? The one thing um, that I had brought up, which I appreciate the answer to, um, is when we were talking about the ADA and someone uh, who had attended the meeting, and I had asked about the fact that, you know, if the school is in line, that was one of the issues that we've had because our schools all need to be updated, a lot of them, and and um, we have so many schools, it's taking a little bit of time for us to get through them. And I had asked about if there was, is there any way to sort of do a temporary, you know, something temporary, and um, we had discussed the fact that um, if there is a, a student or a staff member that needs something, the district will do that right away for that school or for um, where they have to be. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up because I thought that, you know, though we have to wait a while to get everything fully um, updated, we have that av uh, availability. Thank you, that's great. Um, other questions, comments? Okay. I think that's it. Thank you, Mr. Avadia. Thank you, Mrs. Elmore Stratton. Ask you to um, discuss HR. Sorry about that. Lost my notes. Um, so you know, in the tradition of HR. Not much detail is gonna be shared here because we respect the confidentiality um, for our district and for our teams. Um, but I will say that um, we were able to have a longer discussion as a committee with a few other board members in place. And um, I wanna thank Mrs. Adrian and the other administrators that were present uh, because it was quite an extensive meeting that we had. Um, I also can just share, uh, that we did address some of the, the comments that were made uh, in the public session. Um, and we have, I think we all can agree that we're there, that there is a direct plan that can be communicated to rest of board members in exec session only, um, not in this session. 
Um, however, it, they did take the time to detail to us according to some of the, uh, I'll say some of the concerns that we had as a board um, concerning some of the, the, the comments that were made. Um, I will also share that there's a, in, in terms of some of the HR things that have been brought up in the public, there's definite plans in place um, by the admin team uh, to address each of those. Um, and there was plans in place prior uh, to address each of those. And us as board members, um, especially committee members, our jobs is just to ensure that all policies were followed and uh, I's, I's were dotted and T's were crossed. And so we, we ensured that during the meeting as well and clarified some items as well. Um, I did share in that meeting that um, as, a, as the HR chair, I wanna be able to provide you all a bit more uh, detail, uh, but again, that will only happen in exec sessions. Um, so that you all can be informed, uh, informed a little bit uh, better moving forward than I have informed you in the past. Um, and then I want to say, uh, Ms. Adrian did have a nice set of notes that she shared with myself, Dr. Maloche, and um, we can now I can now share those with the rest of the group. Uh, Mr. Ovadia has promised that he will share out with everyone as well in his reports. Um, and is there anything, Ms. Adrian, that you would want to add to that? And um, the only thing I'll say is moving forward for uh, this month and going into our, our June work, it'll really be focused on recruitment and efforts uh, for next year. Um, Ms. Adrian and her team are preparing uh, all of those items in terms of what our needs are, addressing what, what gaps we have, communicating those out properly, and ensuring that we keep with our board goal of recruiting um, and being diverse in our recruitment efforts for the 22-23 school year. Um, also uh, extend the offer, Ben has said it's, it's also okay for if any other board members would like to join our next exec session, um, but you'd have to let Ben know because he's looking at me like, the, the yeah, the next committee session. Um, so if you want to participate, please communicate that to Ben and he'll, he'll let myself and Ms. Adrian and, and uh, Dr. Malash know. And that's going to be on June 14th at 5 p.m. I really can't say much, but if you want to share or I know you were there as part. You know, I, I would just say um, the first two board members that want to join, just let Mrs. Elmore Stratton know. Um, I don't need to be copied. Yeah, so we can only go uh, up to four. And, you know, typically HR has been two, but I think, you know, if people want to join, uh, definitely let Mrs. Elmore Stratton know. But no, that was, that was a good summary, and I think that's what we can share. Okay, I think that I'm just taking a final glance. I think that's good. All right, thank you, Mr. Vadia. Thank you. And next we um, have policy and legislation that will be reported on by Mrs. Fleischer. Thank you so much, Mr. Avadia. Um, we actually met on Tuesday, May 3rd, and we have a few bylaw policies and some discussions for the board to um, discuss um, after I uh, present what we uh, are bringing to the board. Um, the first one is the bylaw 0145, which is board membership res resignation and removal. Um, the committee reviewed the wording that we've had because um, the statutory language for this bylaw differs from district policy. It says that um, a board member could be removed after three consecutive action meetings that they've missed. What we um, discussed is that all of our meetings are actually action meetings now because before there used to be really more of a separation. So there's action meetings that take care take place in the work session work meeting. So to make sure that we're um, all on the same page and that the wording um, is correct, um, the committee agreed to propose the following revised language three consecutive regularly scheduled meetings of the board. So that means not special scheduled meetings because we've had a lot of those this year. Um, and we're also looking at this, but also moving forward for many, many years, You know, not just at this present moment. So it's um, to ask for three consecutive regularly scheduled meetings of the board. If um, a board member was to miss that, they would be it would be up for discussion. It's not an automatic removal if there's extenuating circumstances. Um, so that's what the committee is bringing tonight. And I wanted to see if there 
there's any discussion or difference of anyone. Okay, uh, um, Ms. Stern. I, I just wanna know, did you discuss um, any parameters for like you mentioned extenuating circumstances or did you not get to that level of detail? We didn't get to that level of detail. Um, Mr. Avati is on this too and being a um, the president of the board, um, do you wanna chime in on this? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, sorry, I, I, I missed where we left off, but we, so we talked about, so if people participate remotely. Well, that's a different part. We're gonna get to oh, that. Okay, removal. But no, we're, okay. she's talking about, okay. Um, Mrs. Stern's talking about, did we talk about what extenuating circumstances will be okayed? But we sort of left that open-ended because no, it's going to yeah. be a discussion of the board because there could be different things at any time, correct? Yeah. In, in that sense, it's the people seated on the board that make that. So that, that part's not policy, that, uh, right. but the, the board convenes, it's not automatic. And then we listen to the extenuating circumstances and exact. So it is just to change the wording from um, from three consecutive um, action meetings to just three consecutive regularly scheduled meetings, because that takes out the special meetings. It takes out, you know, it, it doesn't make all the meetings specific to what they actually are. So that would mean like, almost like, you know, we have two regular meetings a month and then one other one. So it'd be like a full month and like one extra um, that they've missed a full month and then that next meeting, and then there would be a discussion. And if something comes up that there's a reason, that the board decides. Any other discussion or questions? Okay. All right, well, thank you. Um, the next one is the policy 5511, which is dress and grooming. Um, this actually needs to be updated. Um, and I think we can all agree. The committee discussed that the impact of the dress code, particularly on females right now, there's a bias on that um, because they can receive conduct infractions because of the clothing styles. And we've talked about how it's very difficult to buy certain clothes. Um, it comes to clothing that have, right now it has clothing that has spandex in it, it has cropped tops. It also, we talked about cultural differences because there's hats and head wear, or head um, coverings that people, not hijabs, which are, which are already okay, but different like caps and different <laughs> things that people feel comfortable with. Um, there actually is going to be a, um, a committee that's gonna have input from students, teachers, um, staff, and, um, and I think that, and parents also, um, and they're going to have these focus groups and they'll also create a thought exchange. So I think this is an ongoing thing. I just think it's very um, important for us to, you know, be open to seeing the differences now versus when this was first written. Any discussion or? Okay, great. The next one is policy 554, five, I'm sorry, 5440, honoring student achievement. Um, and this was a, uh, the committee discussed a short discussion about the policy and discussed the designation of the Valley Victorian on that. Um, and then the next one is policy 5461 of graduation ceremonies. Um, this was another one that we just wanted to bring, um, the committee wanted to bring. Um, in practice, the principles, this is about the timing of East versus West and whether the morning or the afternoon is when they would have their um, graduation um, ceremonies. And in um, practice, there, it's been different in history. Sometimes it had flipped back and forth and it was principal's choice. And so it's been going, it's sort of a little bit um, loose right now as far as what actually happens as far as timing. So um, right now we were um, saying that um, they don't alternate the odd and even number of years as stated in the policy because that is actually how the policy is written. Um, so the committee discussed um, adding a baseline year to the policy as well as language about alternating years for east to west. Um, and we had a discussion about how that is, you know, very, it's, it's sometimes easier for the parents to be able to plan farther in advance to know if it's going to be in the morning or the afternoon. We know that um, right now, Leah Chorus is something that we know for the future that all the school, both schools will be at the same day, but it's just whether it's the afternoon or the morning. Um, and even our student um, advocate or our student representative had mentioned um, that, you know, his mom would like to, to know. And I said, I understand, so would I. Um, so it was something that we thought might be um, good to put into wording. So um, is there any discussion that anyone would like anything different than having a baseline year and then starting to do alternating the morning afternoons for East and West for um, the high school graduations? 
we're not starting at the, this year. They're already set. Um, the morning is east. The afternoon is west. Um, I don't know exactly when. Uh, Ms. Wethington, do you know, like, if would we start it next year? We didn't even state a date, right? This is just sort of our first. So we could, it, it's just, you know, we want to just choose a, a baseline. It could be in two years. It could be, you know, so. Ms. Fleischer, I think we said that we would have Mr. Green look at the language and work on it for us. Thank so you. So he would establish the baseline year. Perfect. Thank you, Mrs. Wethington. I appreciate that. Um, any other discussion or questions? So the next one is, oh, sure, I'm sorry. Yes, oh, I'm sorry. Just, um, 5440 student achievement Yes. and valedictorian. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that in the notes, but there wasn't a lot more information. Is there anything that we sh else we should know about that? Policy so or? that and Ms. Wethington can back me up now. I, I don't know if there, I know what I read the policy, but I can't remember what the change is. It actually is about if there's multiple um, Val Victorians and like who is going to say the speech where it's a lottery like that's written actually in the policy but that's nothing that we're actually changing so Mrs. Webbing can, can yes you? that was not a change that's in the normal course of the policies that we review through the calendar because it's that time of the year that's one of the policies for review there are no Strauss Esme changes to that policy thank you thanks for bringing that up oh yes Ms. Ren I, I don't know if we can we go back to of course you can Mm -hmm. um, for uh, five five one one, um, I I know you guys talked okay. about yes. um, the dress code and its impact on mm -hmm. um, female students. Did we also talk about the impact on um, students that identify just identify as female mm -hmm. and, and transgenders mm -hmm. and and things like that? Because I would like to see that updated. If we don't. That is a good, thank you for bringing that up because we did have that discussion. And in fact, um, also to the point of the graduation, when they hand out the graduation dress codes, right now it is boys wear a tie and pants and, you know, and girls wear, you know, nicer things. And we said it really needs to be a little bit, you know, it, the, the wording needs to be looked at because we need to look at all people and everything that um, everyone dresses differently right now and that there's no infractions that they can't. Um, do that. So that is something that we brought up, but thank you for bringing that to the forefront. And that's part of the reason why I think the focus groups of all the different kids, and we also talked about making sure the focus groups are of diverse kids, right, Ms. Arroyo? You brought that yeah, up. Yeah, they, they, to make sure that it's just like just as many kids from different populations as possible and different active, active levels in this, within the school district to make sure we're hearing everybody. Um, I, we've spent a, quite a while talking about um, the girls dress code um, and just having conversations around like adultification and how that impacts and then code of conduct and how those are related. So um, I'm looking forward to what the feedback is from the students. Thank you, Ms. Rao. Does that, is that? Um... Yeah, no, I love that we had that conversation and I'm just thinking about, you know, all of our various groups, especially some of our clubs mm -hmm. that we have at East and West. And perhaps um, if we do have clubs that are specific to certain populations that we know we want to make sure we have a voice from, if we can tap into those clubs or club leaders or in, and ensure that um, we have the, the right wording, appropriate wording, and we're, we're speaking to everybody and not just female and male. So that's a great point. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Are there any further discussions about that before I move on to the next one? Okay, great. Um, the next is the status update on elementary redistricting committee. And um, I'm going to hand that one over to Mrs. Webbington. So I uh, advise the PNL committee that the elementary redistricting committee has worked on. They have finalized, finalized is not the right word. They've worked on an option that, as Ms. Elmer Stratton said, make it make sense. So it cleans up the map, removes some of the... Um, neighborhoods where this one small development goes to any particular school. Um, and so we were able to run some of the data because Mrs. Sadwin worked with Mrs. King to look at some of the addresses. Uh, the next option is leveling special education programs. One of the big concerns was we don't have special, special classes in every elementary school in the district. So uh, Ms. Mallory and her team and I met to kind of look at what would that look like? We're meeting with the committee again 
next week to talk about those options and how that would impact any particular building with the understanding that if we add a special class in the building, that's gonna change the number of students we can serve in that building. So it's not gonna minimize disruptions, which is one of the board values because you're gonna have that kind of movement. There's just no way around it. So that's where we are. We're working on that option. And then we'll have one more that looks at equity. And I think we will be in a position to talk about finalization. Great, thank you, Mrs. Buthington. And can I have you do the next one too for me, please? Uh, stress as may policy Certainly. alert. Thank you so much. So we have 13 new policies from Stress Esme. Some are fairly benign. There are real substantive changes to the HIV policy. So that that was already on cue for PNL in June. So we'll be having a pretty thorough conversation about HIV policy. It may take more than one meeting because there are a lot of changes. Um, I need to talk to Paul Green a little bit about some of the changes and how we, we would actually get to implementation. So expect um, the policies will first go to the committees and then we'll talk about them in PL committee. Great, thank you so much. And then the next thing is on old business. Um, we have the bylaw 0155.1. That's the board member participation at board meetings using electronic devices. Um, seeing that we're in a new time and age, this is something that we're definitely needing to add to um, our bylaws. And um, what uh, Mrs. Wethington actually did talk with Mr. Green and um, Mr. Green did um, also legally say uh, that it counts as if you are on electronic devices, it counts as a, you know, attendance at the meeting. Um, the one thing that we were talking about is should there be boundaries as far as, and again, we're not talking about just this year. We're, when we put in these bylaws, they're for future also. So we have to think outside of that, right? So um, our discussion centered around um, how many meetings a year um, can someone, so can a board member miss um, and be virtual? So uh, the committee is bringing up two possibilities and that's for up for discussion tonight. Um, one is that it could be two times a year that you could virtually be um, at a board meeting and be counted as here. Or another option is one time a quarter. So it'd be four times a year. Um, so those are our two options that we're bringing up for um, discussion tonight. And I didn't know if anyone had uh, anything to say or, or any of their, any of, uh, you know, your opinions of what you think. Mrs. Tong? I just want to check, did you guys also discuss about the um, uh, special circumstances, if it happened to be, so would that be what, not once every quarter as needed? As Good, um, thank you for bringing that up. We did. Um, so that would also, um, anything um, as far as the virtual, we talked about that, um, extenuating circumstances would be brought to the board um, as just like what we had talked about as far as the missing the three meetings. Mr. Mayor, so, uh, just to follow up then on on, <clears throat> um, on Ms. Tong's question, would that include, for instance, um, say a board member uh, has undergoes uh, some you know medical procedure, um, and as a result is not able to travel or is is advised medically not to be um, present at a meeting, but could still participate virtually, and that whatever that procedure is, is one that may require two, three, maybe several weeks. Um, uh, and if there was a period of say two or three consecutive meetings, which were attended virtually, would that be one of the extenuating circumstances because it would go over either of these two um, proposals? We did have that conversation. Um, and if any of the other um, committee members want to chime in also, but we did have that conversation because I, um, that would be part of the extenuating circumstances. However, we wanted to leave it sort of vague because it's not just about us, right? It's about the future, but that that is what we were talking about when we were talking about extenuating circumstances because we can't, unfortunately we can't, you know, guarantee anything's going to happen or won't happen. Um, or, um, you know, it might be, you know, very strange things that happen. We just don't know, but that we all have to be open to things. And, and honestly, uh, personally, I think, uh, that we all, um, need to take any removal or anything of board members extremely seriously because we were put here by the voters and we're working for them and they trusted us. And, you know, so I think that it, it, 
we have to be serious about it. If we, you know, it's not something that's an easy, okay, they missed that and they're off. I think it takes a lot of discussion. I don't think it's something that should be done lightly at all. Um, so that's where I come from, from this. Um, but I think at the same time, we've always had these in our bylaws. So we need to have, you know, we need to be able to move with the times with things, but also still have some type of boundary. Just added structure to it, yeah. just to make sure that we weren't, we weren't taking advantage or we just didn't, we were just moving along with right. what we have now, which isn't accurate to the way we're actually operating. Um, Mr. Avadia? Yeah, I just wanted to maybe uh, offer a clarification. So when we're talking about like a limit, that's a hard limit. Whether you're in the hospital, whether you're um, away for six months, it's, it's a limit. So if we say for a year, once per quarter, that means after that once per quarter, no, we, you would not be allowed to participate virtually. Where the understanding and, and deliberation would come is an exec if you've missed three. So let's say, you know, you know you're gonna be away for two months. There's a way to do this probably where you can, you know, do one a quarter and be okay where it doesn't, it, where it doesn't iterate into exec where we would understand that, you know, you're getting a, you know, a heart transplant and, and you're going to be out, but you'll be back. And, and we understand that. Um, so that's where sort of the, the deliberation comes. But if, if we impose a limit of twice a year or once a quarter, I think the intent of the committee, if I'm getting it right, um, is that, that that's it. That would be hard and fast. So no matter what, you can attend virtually for full credit once the second time you wouldn't until the next quarter arrives. So it, it is sort of like once we put it into policy, we really want to live with it. But then the related policy where it's removal gets triggered. Now, I agree with uh, with um, Mrs. Fleischer is that, you know, it has to be very serious. We take it because fundamentally these seats are filled by the public. So it's not an issue of a willy nilly, but it's more an issue of like we have to have a discussion. That's not a discussion we would have in public, um, but it would get triggered because you'd be over a certain limit that's that's codified in policy. Does that make sense? Mrs. Stern? I mean, I, I have to say, I think virtual, you know, participation in my, in my mind is preferable to no participation, to, to missing a meeting. Um, you know, if the person makes the judgment that they're capable of participating, um, I prefer that. So that's just where I weigh in. I also think it's helpful to have a clearly decided policy about what is going to trigger the discussion because right now we've been in a strange time, you know, and, and many of us have had to miss a meeting and or attend virtually. I know I have, um, you know, and I, so I, I think um, I would definitely be in favor of having all those pieces in place. And, and I think, you know, um, you know, regardless of, you know, opinions and feelings at the end of the day, I have to say, I also agree with what Mrs. Fleischer and Mr. Arvadia are saying. Arvadia is saying, I mean, this is, these are public, we're, we're publicly elected. So, you know, it's a pretty big deal to say, well, you know, someone missed a few meetings and maybe they have extended circumstances. Maybe they shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't be in the seat. Well, I think we have to take it pretty seriously. So that's where I stand with that. Any um, more Stratton? Just a question, uh, and just because I don't know. So do we have the power as a board if someone is abusing whatever we laid out? We have the po uh, power to say that person is no longer on the board to take them off? It, no, the only way that we can remove a board member is if they miss three meetings in a row without good cause. That's what the law says. And then we have a policy like we're talking about now to put that in. So, and the two policies work together, as we said. Who the board defines good cause, but it is a discussion between the board. I mean, I, every single board has that policy because the law is the law. I've never seen it used once in the last 17 years to remove a board member. I've seen it threatened, but once you do that, they get back and, you know, they, they, they do what they have to do. But it is such a serious move to remove a board member that it, it really does take a lot you know, of discussion, it almost like a hearing, there's a, there's a lot of steps involved. So it's not just a, you've missed three meetings, we don't, you know, you're out. It, it's a discussion. Thank you so much for that clarification. I appreciate it. Do you have a follow up? Yeah, no, I was going to say the same thing. Thank you for clarifying, because I, I know that when I listen to these meetings, 
pre coming on this board. I'm like, they have the power to do it all. Kick her out. <laughs> Go. Um, and I just want to be clear that that's not something we actually can do, that it has a whole policy behind it and a structure behind it. Mrs. Tong, did you have a question? Uh, yes, not really a question, but thank you for putting that in place because I it was very I was very grateful for when my family need that um, I had to be on remote for about a um, month and a half or two closer of in between. I might have a few more in between, but just that put in place makes me understand and we are public figures, so we need to a bit as much as we can. And I think that it's very nice that we did that and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tong. Is there any further discussion? Um, yes, Ms. Stratton. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm killing with the questions right now. One other question, it may not even be for you, Mrs. Fleischer, but for our attorney, do you know what the trends around the state are in terms of boards that, because almost all of them went to virtual, like are any of them, is there any of them that have done this already that we can look at and be like such and such school districts are comparable to us and here's what they moved to? just so we can compare, I guess, help us? Yeah, I, a lot of, uh, pretty much every district's having the discussion. I would say it's maybe 25% that have actually put a policy into place to say a board member can attend three meetings virtually or, or how they would attend virtually. Cause there's a lot of discussion that goes into it. You always get the question, what if I'm on vacation or, you know, versus what if I'm sick or can you participate in executive session virtually? There's some, you know, do the votes count? Um, so there's all that discussion. I, I'd say every board is talking about it, but I've only seen it in place in about 25%. But there are certainly policies you can look at, and I'll send them over uh, to Dr. Malash. That would be great. Great question, Ms. Um, Elmer Stratton. I think, you know, I think maybe getting the information and bringing it back and, and because he, you brought up some wonderful questions, to be honest, um, that we sort of touched upon, but if we want to make the policy, we need to have it fully developed before we set it down. Mrs. Uh, Ms., <laughs> Mrs. Stern. Thank you. Thank you for helping me with my earlier stumbling. I'm not the only one. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Fleischer. Um, I just, I guess the other thing I just want to say is, you know, just to all of you guys, I mean, I, you know, we, we spend a lot of time, a lot of time as, you know, publicly elected volunteers doing this work and, you know, and to do it well, you have to spend a lot of time, really. I mean, it's a lot of reading, it's a lot of attending, it's a lot of meetings, it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, and I think we're also human beings who have families and lives. And you know, in, in our board, our, this year alone, we've had numerous deaths and illnesses and, and medical situations that, that this, multiple people have faced. Um, and, and yet we've shown up. And I think you know, we have to have a little grace for ourselves, I, I think, as you know, someone who tries to hold myself pretty high standards to making sure I show up. Um, so I think it's important to have that grace and I think a flexibility of a virtual meeting, which we now are probably all experiencing in our professional and personal lives, um, makes sense. So just to add to that. So I appreciate that. Um, and, and so true, it's sort of on the back of what Mr. Mayor said, right? Extenuating circumstances, like, is that something that we do have to put into this virtual part, which we did not have at all? But on the point of Ms. Ravadia, there's it's it, there's two there's two thought processes in this. Um, so I think it maybe you know we need to have a little bit more information. Maybe are we you know take a little bit more time to discuss the policy, Ms. Ravadia? You had yeah. I mean it's it's one of those the I, I do think if if PNL is going to move forward with this, you know we wanted to bring these two recommendations today. So it sounds like people want a more permissive policy, which I think would be one a quarter. Um, you know, do people agree with that or are people more in favor of kind of an unlimited virtual attendance? I, I don't, I, I see people much more on the sort of liberal side of it, which is fine. Um, but I think we want something to take back so we can move this forward next month at PNO. I definitely am seeing at least, I'm seeing the four, one a quarter, um, as far as of the two that I said. But um, I know we want to move forward with this, but is there enough of support of that? Do we want to look un unlimited or do we want to raise the amount? I'm not sure. Does anyone have any discussion, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, I, I'm just curious as to why it's uh, so stark one or the other. It's either one or a quarter or unlimited. I don't know that it needs to be either. At least that, that's my personal opinion. Um, 
you know, what, what was the, what was the thinking around one as opposed to maybe two? Was there a discussion of going above one or was the discussion limited to one a quarter, none at all? I imagine that was a discussion um, or unlimited. There really, we had sort of, we, we started from here and went down real, real small. So to be honest, um, there wasn't the two a quarter. Um, not to say that that can't be the answer, but that's not what the, where the discussion went. Um, but, you know, I can understand where you're coming from. Um, I think all of us with all the, like what Mrs. Stern said, I mean, we, we've had a lot of things come up and sometimes, you know, I, I don't know if the wording has to be, like you said, so strict. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not, you know, Ms. Fleischer, can I assist? Sure. Um, the committee asked me, Mr. Mayor, the committee asked me to discuss this with Mr. Green, and we talked about two options. One was one per quarter. He said he thought that was okay. The other was two per, two per year. He said he thought that was also okay. It was the board's decision. Those were two options that we talked about that I believe came out of the committee conversation. I was trying to figure out from him, based on his experience working with districts, did that seem reasonable? Any further questions? No, I was just Ryan? going to say that that um, he Paul has been looking at this uh, and options for this for quite a while. We've had this conversation on the table for again quite a while. Um, I'm in favor of the four or like one per quarter. Um, you know, and like just personally, if I'm on vacation, no, I don't want to be here um, virtually or not. If I'm sick, I was recovering from COVID and. I was well enough to be on because I just was still testing negative without symptoms, but you know what I mean? Like those, those situations, I don't think we need it um, to be, to go, if we expand it to more virtual, we're going to be in the same space we're in now. And for that, not, don't create a policy, don't do all this work. So, I mean, that's how I view it. Um, so I'm, a, I'm in favor for just to make it more one per quarter. Thank you, Ms. Arara. Any other discussion or are we good to move on? I think um, getting the idea from the committee that um, I would say the majority is saying, you know, one a quarter to bring back to our committee. So thank you for that discussion, everyone. I appreciate it. Um, the next and last thing is um, calendars. Mrs. Oh, Mrs. Yes. Fleischer, I'm so sorry. Could I just go back to the discussion earlier um, that Mrs. Wethington, you were talking about with the elementary school redistricting? Just could you clarify? I don't know that I understood it fully um the piece about the committee looking at the special education um classes and that affecting attendance could you just I, I don't know that I understand the full picture of what piece you're looking at because this is what's going to from this will come recommendations is that correct yes okay. so let me, if you just give me one minute Miss Stern sure. I just want to go to my notes because we talked to the board about wants and desires for the process and came up with some themes. Is that a familiar conversation? So oh, yeah, absolutely. like that is really our guidepost as we have the conversation, what were the board's desires uh, and values? So the themes were, one was um, reducing, minimizing disruptions. One was, I just had to open it. So transportation, diversity, special programs and student disruption were the four areas you asked us to keep in mind. So the first area, and then Ms. Elmer Stratton, Elmer Stratton, make it make sense. So the first area that we looked at was really um, cleaning up the map. And that kind of hits a lot of different points. Um, the next was special programs, because you thought it was important to have special programs uh, across the district in different buildings and to consider that um, from the beginning and look at a plan. So that was our next point. So the only way to really address that because we don't have the census to put one of every program in every building, nor would that be productive because kids need, need to have a continuum in any given building. So we looked at how to shift programs from buildings that maybe have more programs than they should have to buildings that don't have programs. But in doing that, so for example, if an elementary school has no special classes and we add two. We could not add one because we need kids to go from one level to the other. Then we're taking two rooms offline. Does that make sense? It so does, it does, the space yeah. for those children no longer is this. So we have to shift the number of kids we can serve in that building. 
Okay. No, that does make sense. Okay. I, I, cause I was, wasn't sure if you were saying that you were looking at putting each program in every building, no, which I know we said no, we did not no, want to no, move in that direction. That. So, no. yep. okay. So we're going to get, I guess, a view of doing that and also not doing that when correct when come back to us okay. because that is not going to align with minimizing student disruption right okay yeah so, no, absolutely yeah. okay that makes a lot of sense thank you okay no problem thank you mrs Wellington. thank you mrs stern the last um one that we have to talk about is policy 8210 the school year and 2024-25 school year calendar um mrs Wellington provided revised calendars for our review and they'll be reviewed at the june committee meeting the two um calendars that we saw have one difference right now. Um, the it's that the kid, the students would have off the district would have off um, January 6 for three Kings Day. Um, and then uh, the other revised does not have that but then has a um, in service day in March on a Friday. Um, one of the things that was brought up is because between MLK day and spring break on that year, there is no there are no times off. So it's a long time for the kids to come. Um, so that was a discussion that we um, that we had. Um, Mrs. Araya, do you want to? Yeah, actually, when I saw the updated versions, I was a little surprised um, because culturally, Three Kings Day, and I just wanted to like share some history. Three Kings Day in Latino culture is a big deal. It's not. It's not just uh, like I understand. Um, it's what is that? The Epiphany. I'm sorry, I'm not like translating you know, outside of Spanish or Hispanic culture. Um, but we celebrate um, Three Kings Day. My kids get taken, they stay home from school and it's a huge event um, for us. And um, other school districts, again, with um, larger populations of Latinos um, also have off and on school day. So when I presented it, um, what was it a year and a half ago um, to discuss, um, that was the reason why. Um, to incorporate Latino culture and not um, that we don't do a good job of it here in the district. I'd like to see more of it. And I think that would just be one more aspect of us of supporting our Latino community. Um, and I think uh, it'd be important to incorporate that. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there because when I saw this update, I was a little thrown off and I had, um, and someone was like, someone mentioned it, it was attached to a Catholic holiday. And I'm like, mm. I'm sorry, it's like a little more than that for us. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Three, um, Los de Reyes Magos, it's like a thing, it's huge. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, more than happy to share some culture and history. Thank you, Ms. Arroyo. Does anyone else have any questions with that? Yes, Ms. Stratton, Ms. Elmer Stratton. Um, Mrs. Arroyo almost took my thunder on that one because I was gonna say, I'm so glad that that new calendar had those on there and I hope we're really considering it. And just to add from the student that commented this evening, is it possible for it to be on your agenda to, and I know the next two years is done. Don't look at me, Ms. I see you like, friend, don't you change something in this calendar. Um, but in the vein that we know everything's a process and we can plan two years out, three years out, can we at least look at two years, three years, if Eid is also a possibility in some fashion um, and what that might look like or, or what, the way that might alter um, and then just, you know, because again, we're, there's a public meeting, just reminding folks, you know, that if there's something, I'm sure that Dr. Malosh, there's a policy on if, if a, a student needs to, uh, desires or needs to observe something, they could communicate that to their principal or administrator and possibly be excused, or at least they, they can explain the nature of it, right? Or yes, students are, they're excused absences for religious holidays. Um, I also have a meeting scheduled on the 17th um, with a group of students from High School West, uh, and there'll be a group of students from High School East that'll be on virtually um, from the, the Muslim Student Associations of both high schools to discuss Eid, uh, you know, and their desire for us to be closed uh, in the future. Um, so we certainly can talk about that, you know, at the June uh, PNL meeting, um, you know, and, and look at what that what that means for the calendar. Uh, one of the things that we have looked at, you know, as we've talked about calendar. Um, you know, is that we've added a number of additional days when we are closed during the course of the academic year. Um, you know, when we look at Diwali, at Lunar New Year, uh, at Three Kings Day, if we look at a day, you know, the, the student that called in tonight would like us to be closed three days for Eid. Um, you know, those are just additional days. We just have to be done by June 30th. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, that's the, the piece of it at the end of the year. 
Um, That's what I was going to ask is if there's a, uh, and do we still operate off of like, we have to do 180 days or 183 or something? So like that? We're, we're 182 student contact days is, is what the contract is here in Cherry Hill. It's 187 um, staff days for certificated staff, but it's 182 student contact days. Okay. So we do 182. Okay. Well, I'm glad we can at least, I, I hope that committee, um, I hope y'all talk about that in the next one and maybe two years down the road, we can we can have another something that someone brought up that we can make an impact. Thank you, Mrs. Elmore Stratton. I appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Um, Malash. And I agree, I was going to bring that up because I think that is a perfect point to, that's what our committees are here for. And thank you to the student that called in and for the students that are speaking from the high schools um, with the um, administration um, to let their voices be heard too. Um, it's always an interesting line because of how many days we have to be in school, but I'm hoping that we can work something out. Um, so is there any other discussion? Yes, Mr. Rabadia. Yeah, I just want to echo my support for both. I think we should do um, Three Kings Day because we have deliberated quite a while as a board, and I think we should look at at Eid. But I mean, I, I would like to, for Eid, which is a little further out, I, I would like to hear what the students, um, you know, come up with. But you know, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's good. I, I guess when 182 must be a board policy. It is. It, it's local. It's 100, the, the state statute's 180, um, and, and locally we're at 182. But you're not recommending looking at that. I am not recommending opening up the teacher's contract, no. Okay, <laughs> that sounds fair. All right, thanks, Dr. Mosh. Thank you very much. Any other discussion? Yes, Mr. So I'm not on PNL, so I won't be part of that discussion then, but I mean, if we start to, you know, look at the calendar, which, which is adding, you know, days in, I think, does that push us to look at our overall breaks and time out of school? Like I know, you know, I'm going to just say something here because we're, I'm not on this committee, but like, you know, some districts don't have a full week off for spring break, for instance, you know, is that like, would be we moving in that direction at that point to consider perhaps, you know, a five, you know, five day weekend, so to speak, but maybe not a full long week off. And that would allow us to have um, perhaps the spring day in you know, in service, you know, which gives the students a break, although think about the teachers getting a break too, but, you know, and also, you know, recognizing we have a very rich, you know, cultural um, mix in our town and in our school district. So I think recognizing all that, all the different groups and these important days is really is significant, you know, and I just had, I'm just trying to think about balance. Is that a way to consider balancing it long-term um, you know, I mean, we, we have other, you know, groups that we recognize and we have days off because they've long established groups in this town and, you know, cultural backgrounds or religious backgrounds. I think it makes sense to recognize that we're in a different time. Thank you, Mrs. Stern. Um, and I think um, Mrs. Wethington, I don't know if you have anything else to add, but I know that it also, sometimes when we look at the calendars so far out, you know, some of the holidays that we're talking about now end up being on the weekend. And so that's something, you know, there's, there's logistical things that sometimes happen. Um, so that, you know, that's a good thing. And we might be able to, you know, work that out. It would help. Yes, that is accurate. Every year it's more challenging because <laughs> the days shift and we're trying to fit everything in. We're also trying to fit in professional development days for teachers. So there's a lot to get into the calendar. It seems like a lot of days, but at the end of the day, it's not. Um, and there is one year, uh, it might be 23, 24, where we did have conversations about the spring break. It was really challenging to make that work. Yeah. The spring break is actually split that year. Yeah. Yeah. It's still the same number of days off or school is there's, closed, but spring break is split. Yeah. There was no way to, there was no way to honor everything. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other discussion? Um, I think that we were hearing that we think Three Kings Day is something that, um, that we had brought to here that is important and we'll look at further uh, um, holidays, especially Eid and other um, ones when we come back to the committee the next time. So thank you for all the discussion. Um, that is all that we have for tonight. Mrs. Wethington, is there anything else that I missed? You covered everything, Ms. Fleischer. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for your help. Great job. Mrs. Fleischer, that's your first... Uh... Can you report? Thank you. Very thorough. Um, 
Mrs. Tong, we're going to turn to you for strategic planning. All right, I'm going to have to pass it to Ms. Shaker. I don't think we have, I have any. Um, just an update on uh, project applications. Uh, all of the project applications have been submitted at this point. Uh, we have received, I believe, nine or 10 of the PEC letters um, from the state. Uh, we need all of the PEC letters in order to start talking about uh, what the question looks like, what we're going to include, what we're not going to include. Um, and so I know that we had, I think, slated um, to have a larger conversation about the question uh, at the next board meeting. I don't know that um, we're going to be able to do that because I don't believe we're going to have all of the PEC letters back yet, but I'm hoping that in June that we can we can have that. Um, we have a meeting with um, our financial advisor, our bond council, um, and Mr. Garrison on Thursday morning. Um, we're working on some timelines, um, which we'll share with the board at some point on kind of what that looks like, what our statutory deadlines are for uh, the county and um, elections. Um, and then, um, you know, should hopefully be able to have an update on the 24th on what that looks like. And one of the things we, we, we had talked about, but I wanted to just get a sense is, you know, I, I mean, and I understand, of course, this takes time and, and the state, but is it worth considering adding a meeting to essentially solidify the bond question? Because there's a domino effect here, I think. It, it may be, uh, Mr. Avadia, we'll have to kind of see um, what the pace is over the next couple of weeks with the PEC letters, um, but we may need to consider that. I don't have anyone have questions. Yeah. All right. Nope. Thank you, Mrs. Tong. Um, that will take us. That will take us to our action agenda. Uh, Mrs. Arroyo, could you move the CNI agenda, please? Yes. The superintendent recommends, and I move the following: twenty-three point one approval of attendance at conference or workshops for the 2021-2022 school year. Approval of attendance, or twenty-three point two approval of attendance at conference workshops for twenty. 22-23 school year and resolution 23.3 resolution for approval of settlement agreement. May I have a motion? Second. <laughs> Thanks. Miriam, any questions? Okay. Ms. Sugars. Hey board members, we have opened up the online voting. You may cast your votes. Oh, click on. Uh, we have a unanimous yes vote. Thank you, Ms. Stern. Would you move um, BNF, please? <coughs> Superintendent recommends, and I move the following. Uh, 24.1, approval of bill lists. 24.2, resolution for the award of bids. 24.3, resolution approving transfer of funds to allow for funding of construction project, pain and back site and accessibility improvement. Resolution for change, award of change orders and 24 point, I'm sorry, that was 24.4, 24.5, action consent to approve business and facilities items 24.1 to 24.4. Are there any questions? Do I have a second? Um, uh, Mrs. Fleischer, do I have any questions? I'll get the hang of this eventually. <laughs> okay. Uh, if not, um, 
Then Mrs. Sugars, if you could have a vote, please. Hey, board members, we have opened up the online voting. You can cast your votes. We have a unanimous yes vote. Thank you, Mrs. Elmore Stratton. Uh, would you please move the HR agenda? Um, okay, the superintendent recommend, nope, saying that wrong. Superintendent recommends and I move the following 25.1 termination of employment certificate. I can't, my braces won't allow that. So I'm going to read part of that. This is every week. Um, 25.2 termination of employment, 25.3 appointments, 24, 25.4 appointments, 25.5 assignment salary change, 25.6 contract renewals, 25.7 contract renewals, 25.8 contract renewals, and 25.9 other compensation. Do I have a second? Mrs. Fleischer, any questions? Okay, Mrs. Sugar. The online voting is open. You may cast your votes. We have a unanimous yes vote. Turn it over to Dr. Malaj. Thank you, Mr. Avadi. I just want to highlight that in um, section 25.1, termination of employment certificated included in there uh, is Mr. Sean Sweeney, uh, who's the president or principal at Barton Elementary School, uh, has submitted his resignation. He was approved last evening as the new director of curriculum and instruction for the Medford Township School District, uh, where he will begin early in July. Um, so he'll finish out the school year and, and will still be with us in the beginning of July. Uh, but congratulations, Mr. Sweeney. Uh, we'll be taking his experiences from the past eight years here in Cherry Hill with him um, over to Medford. Thank you, Dr. Malash. Um, Okay, uh, Mrs. Fleischer, would you please move the uh, let's see, policy and legislation? Yes, the su superintendent recommends, and I move the following number 26.1 approval of harassment, intimidation, bullying invest investigation decisions. Do I have a second? Ms. Tong, any questions or discussion? No? Then, Mrs. Sugars, can you um, open the vote? The online voting is open. You can cast your votes. Okay, we have a unanimous yes vote. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are no items for action this evening under strategic planning, um, but your time will come, strategic planning. So is there any new business to discuss this evening? Is there any old business to discuss this evening? Oh, Mrs. Arroyo. I just wanted to, um, one of the items we had on our um, CNI old old business was SAC update, and I just wanted to share that they're going to be they're reviewing that and sharing more information later. I just wanted to let everybody know that that was part of the conversation, small part because we ran out of time. That's great. Any, anyone else? So I, I, I do have something just because I, I don't know, I missed, uh, in March, we discussed a CNI retreat on June 29th. I just can't find the evidence because I know I, <laughs> and I, I know, I know, I know. I asked, and I think that's what we're. Okay. Does that does that seem to work for everyone? 
June 29th. So we, we talked about doing a CNI retreat. Now, what I'm wondering with uh, Dr. Melanchia at my right here is we talked about a CNI retreat and we talked about a CNI retreat that was themed portrait of a graduate. Now, if we do it on the 29th, it would be a standalone meeting. I don't know if it's possible to do both. It would not be possible if we did it with it, but essentially June 29th, could we spend the evening on a CNI retreat? And it's got to work for Mrs. Arroyo. Okay. So the idea I think is to, um, for, for administration to kind of take us through, you remember we did the, um, the policy and legislation retreat? So it's, it's kind of to get more of a sense of like from an educational standpoint, from a discussion, and then portrait of a graduate, I think, as, as a component of that is kind of like, you know, I mean, it's look, I, I mean, we, lo we love our students and, and, and they are primary here, but we're also producing you know, a, a, a product, right, of, of um, people to go out into the world and do great things. The question of portrait of a graduate is kind of like, what does that look like? What, what's the what's the equipment? What's the armor? What's the knowledge base, what's the experience? I think, I mean, I'm just yeah. paraphrasing. Okay, so more or less I'm on the right. Um, so I think it's just, it's to spend some intentional time together with our educational experts to kind of like get a, get a glimpse, have the discussion, get, get a sense of, because as we bring in kind of community values and what that looks like. So I think it's sort of like, it's, a, it's not a board business, but it's sort of an educational and brainstorming and um, consensus building-ish. Does that make sense? Yes. It'll be helpful with all the changes and updates that we've been going through and then attach that to some of the movement forward, just like get a, for everybody to get a better understanding, kind of put out there what what questions they've had. Um, but now we'll have a little bit more time just to focus on some details that we may not have focused on before. I'm just thinking too, we're about to embark on discussion of district goals, which well, we started the discussion last week and now we're going to continue on. Um, we were really wanting to get ahead of it and not be doing that in the fall, which is what we've done the past couple of years. So we had this, like, I think a nice goal of getting that done in the next month. But I think this piece with the retreats really important. I was about to, to ask what was yeah. the timeline for that? Because if yeah. you, I think you really need this conversation to Absolutely. have, to, to, just to be able to do a, your due diligence in that. So I don't know what the timeline was exactly, but maybe extending that a bit. So our yeah. our goal is as as a board as it is right now is to approve district goals by the last meeting of July at the latest. So this would put us almost a month ahead of that. So the, the timing actually would be perfect this way. Now, you know, the, the subcommittee will have a point of view that they'll share with the board before this, but I think there's still ample time to really, you know way in as a board, which is what we want to do. So it would fit pretty nicely on the timeline that way. So, yeah. Mrs. Elmore Stratton. So is that, um, oh, I always talk to you. <laughs> um, so for that week though, you're saying in that retreat, our administrators would be a part of it, obviously, because they're the experts they're going to teach us, right? So are we good, Dr. Malosh, with that week? I'm just thinking about like, they. I know they're 12 month employees, but are, is, the, is there like a break between like school stopped, start planning for summer? Like, do they get time off? Like, I just feel like that's like, I, I'm, I'm just basing that off of like Philadelphia. I know they like to take a little, like one week to let teachers brains stop working and then get into the summer. Yeah, I, I will confirm with the administrators tomorrow that week, um, figure the Monday, the 27th, uh, we're expecting that we'll probably there'll probably be a presentation at town council that evening. Uh, Tuesday the twenty eighth, we have a regularly scheduled board meeting um, that's there, so we'll we'll be together. Um, but I will speak with the administrators tomorrow. Okay, I just I solely ask for the purposes of like when do they get a time to breathe, and especially since that's right before Fourth of July holiday. So <laughs> that that sweet spot's normally like June thirtieth, July first. Okay, like that's the downtime those two days. As I figured. Okay. <laughs> Um, actually, um, I'm not going to be around for that, but I will be at the meeting the night before. But my question is, will that be um, recorded like some of the other things? So we'll be able to yes. update that because it looks like it will be very helpful. And I'm sorry to disappoint. But Yeah, no, what's what's good about board retreats? Because look, I mean, I, and other members of the board have mentioned it tonight, but 
the ask of time on the board, I don't think, I don't think it really is widely understood. And so I, I think people just can't be at everything. I mean, I know I'm missing a meeting um, and we all will. And it's just, you know, uh, last week, I think it was, I had six to strict engagement in seven days. So it's just one of those, like, we understand. What's nice is it's recorded. And what's nice is that, as we see, th these things evolve. And so it's not, if you miss it and you catch up on the live stream, you'll be well on your way to being, you know, in there. All right, great. And that brings us to, unless there are other new items, or, I'm sorry, old items, then that will bring us to second public. Oh. Yeah, I would hold it for now. We'll, we'll try to clarify sort of timing and if that will uh, truly work for the administration. And um, okay, yep, hold that for now, please. Um, second public comment, all right. This is the second public comment section during which you may comment on any topic. If you would like to speak now, please clearly state your name and municipality. <clears throat> we will alternate between speakers here in the room and those that are online. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak. The timer on the screen will indicate the amount of time you have remaining. Cherry Hill is a community that values education and educational topics often bring out a passionate response. The Cherry Hill Board of Education supports a school climate in which our diversity is a source of strength and all are included. Respect is foundational in how we treat you, how we treat each other, and how we support our administration and staff in their essential work. Please join us in practicing the utmost respect for all. And I will begin in the room. The floor is yours. Hi, Dr. Pina Mintz, Cherry Hill residents. I also represent Cherry Hill Parents for Academic Excellence. Um, thank you for your service to this community. My comment today is addressed to Board of Education members, Dr. Malosh, Cherry Hill School Administrators, teachers, parents, and students. It entails the updated New Jersey sexual education curriculum beginning this fall. Uh, parents do not co-parent with the government. Any cultural or sexuality related conversation are the sole domain of parents, not schools. As of this coming fall, the schools will be introducing child pornography curricula to all Cherry Hill students as early as kindergarten. It will be in every subject, in every grade level, and in every book. The Cherry Hill Library, public library already has 96 books on transgender topics, surprisingly books on traditional family values unlimited. I call this Cherry Hill parents to wake up and guard your children's innocence from sexual exploitation by the updated New Jersey State Sexual Education Curriculum. You will have no chance of opting out since that new sexuality curriculum is infused to every lesson in every subject and grade. I call upon this Board of Education to delay implementation of the new sexuality education curriculum and to ban any books that have the new pornographic content. I call on this board to ban immediately the AMAZE program that shows pornography to our students. I call on this board to ban any conversation with children about sexuality without the presence of a parent. I call on this board to ban the relations of the school district with the Garden State Equality Organization that developed this pornographic curricula. Really, the only way, as all of you have mentioned, you are representing the voters, is you're in charge of guarding the safety of these children. Uh, you are leaving Cherry Hill parents with no option. They can either pursue academic excellence elsewhere and protect their children from child sexuality grooming. So I'm asking you to take it very seriously and to delay any decisions of introducing this new sexual curriculums into our schools. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the line with Dave. Dave, the floor is yours. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Dave. I'm in the Woodcrest section of Cherry Hill. Um, I really would... Dave, Back up, Panina. Can provide, here. Yes. Can you provide your last name as well? Um, I prefer just to give my last initial. We'll allow it, Dave. And that is K. You have my email, and Dr. Malosh has emailed me before, so it's, nothing's hidden there. Um, I really want to back Panina up about this sexual education. Um, I have gone through many decades of therapy because I was molested through my entire high school 
education by a teacher. So having this kind of content in a school with parents not involved is putting you guys and the school district, the town, everybody up for some major lawsuits, some major issues going on with these kids having issues later in life. Now, I didn't realize how much this ab sexual abuse by a teacher affected me till I was in my mid thirties. Not when I was 18, not when I was 25, not during my first marriage, but after my first marriage through a lot of therapy. So having these kids being taught by a teacher that, yeah, okay, we send our kids to school to trust the teachers, to trust the system, which is failing our kids. I don't trust teachers, period, okay? They need to get back to teaching, reading, writing, arithmetic, and leave the sexual education to our family values, to our church values, our religious values, and leave all that discussion at home. I implore the district, I implore the parents to wake up, look at the media, and you will find any given week a teacher in another part of the country or even in New Jersey that has molested a student or has gone to jail for having a, a party with students. It is not that odd of it to happen, period. Please rethink this shut it down and these parents need to wake up and get involved in their children's education. Sexual education needs to be left at home. We need to bring the parents back into the mix and stop letting our government teach our kids about sexual education. Our government is not a parent. Thank you. Thank you. We'll return in the room. I don't know if anyone's making their way up. Okay, uh, sir, floor is yours. Rick Short, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Uh, first, I'd like to start going over with the calendar that you guys just spoke about. It's pretty weird to think about it, but there's over 70 different languages in Cherry Hill. We already have X amount of days. So what would be equal if we start finding other national days to take off over certain um, eth ethnic people? Where does it stop? Do we start April, do we start August 15th and end June 30th? Do we give our teachers 40 paid days? When does it stop? Why do we keep adding days? Why can't we just be what we are? You guys talk about this diversity. And every time, at least for children, you can't bring in diversity, can you? You learned. You had an official. You had an administrator speak at the Rosa thing, said it was impossible to do diversity because it was too much busing involved. But... You keep saying it's gonna be diverse. Doesn't make any sense. Next up, the equity audit. I would love to know how many other schools in New Jersey are doing an equity audit. You know, I'd also like to know if there's any scientific proof of an equitable curriculum, if it's ever been done anywhere in the US? Has there ever been an equitable curriculum in every class? Some of us in the community think equity is destroying our schools. Example, HVAC. How in the world can we logically think that we want to be equitable between all 19 schools when you have three or four that you could have replaced the entire HVA system for $7 million. This is what's destroying our schools, ladies and gentlemen. Equity. We all want equality education. That's what we want. We want an equal education for everyone. But no, it has to be equitable because we have to have equitable 
And then we had to have diversity, which we can which we can't have with students, but we can have with with teachers and hiring procedures because you even said it. So we're on the bad path. We keep making everything equitable. In 10 to 15 years, this is going to be a horrible school district. <clears throat> we're gonna we're gonna go on the line um, to who I believe is Dr. Podowitz, and the floor is yours. And my name is Jeff Podowitz, and I live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I'm reading from New Jersey School Boards Association, um, the special education, a service, not a place, New Jersey School Board Association Task Force on Special Education. You can find that online. Um, quote from the very beginning, and that's all I can read. Stop talking about cost cutting. Talk instead about cost effectiveness. It's a difference that cuts to the heart of the matter. Cost cutting assumes that we are talking, taking something away from children. No one wants to support that. Support it. Cost effectiveness means getting the same or better results for less money. No one wants to not support that. And that's from Nathan Weather Levinson, a win-win approach to reducing special ed costs. Introduction, first line, to address the continuing pressure that special education places on local district budgets. Mm, it's special ed. Check the Cherry Hill special ed PTA felt, and rightly so, over 10 years ago, that it was how we were being cheated by the state with our aid. That's what the pressure was from, not special ed. But of course, the school board association feels that that's the problem. I saw something online. Uh, it's a summary. I don't know. It says, and this is about the new texts. KF, I think I know who KF is, a board member, asked if all these required texts have an audio option available for students with special needs. Mm. Answer. They had not looked into it, but they should. I'm a little bit confused that you're just talking about audio tapes. What about digitalized text as an option? Do you have that? How many kids in the school district with special ed, and I'm sure in the high school, there's got to be at least two or 300 just in the high schools, have received assisted, an assistive technology evaluation? In this district, I suppose there has to be at least two or three hundred in this. And, and what about them? Do you use Chrome and other things to provide digitalized text? Is digitalized text provided in the district with screen readers? That could be the Chromebook. And, and that's a question that I have. What's going on with that? I, I suppose there are a couple of hundred kids and they weren't considered with these new texts. Um, anyway, that's my question and, and maybe KF can answer me. She's a board member or someone else who knows about it or I mean, I don't know. That was a question. Was did you get an answer? Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um Dr. Potter was just a note of procedure. When you bring things up here, um Dr. Malash has an opportunity to answer it after. Um you would not at a board meeting uh, traditionally receive a, an answer from a board member. Um, who also is is um, is not present, but just wanted to clarify that from a process perspective. Okay, we're back in the room, looking hopefully, but we are back on the line with Jen. And Jen, I, our uh, our process today has allowed you to uh, do a last letter, but we would like that and your municipality as you start. The floor is yours. Hello, it's uh, Jen Nadio. Um, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, just have a couple quick questions. Um, I said it at the last meeting. Um, <laughs> deep Peace is a board goal and started by the character ed position on Zone PTA. And I heard earlier that there were 40 to 50 people in a meeting today, and I'm sure that they were part of the district. But I guess the concern that I have is if it's a board goal and in the board goal, it had asked for parental 
or, or organizations to be present, then why aren't we invited to these meetings, but only to the quarterly meetings? Um, it's very important to have our voice, especially with the content, the AAPI content that's going to be included. Um, we also have some questions on the special ed side about ICR classes and when um, uh, ICR classes can be added to honors, to AP, and to all classes in um, middle and high school that are required. These, this is part of, you know, the proficiency in our in our schools and the equity in our schools. And so um, that those that's kind of I'm I'm feeling a lot of concern from the community, but also C piece was really important. I know that there were some people that weren't showing up, but it was really important and it made some really great decisions and we need to bring it back. And we need the people at the table. We need parents at the table. Um, so I guess I'm gonna give up my minute six and um, thank you for, for listening. Thank you. We're, uh, we're gonna go uh, remain with the line with Craig Becker. You're next. Hi, it's Beth Becker again, I'm Cherry Hill. Uh, just a couple things. First, um, for the board solicitor, are we paying, um, there's just something for the board to look into, are we paying travel expense from Florham Park? Just wondering about that. Um, my second thing was um, the dress code. Um, just thank you so much. Thank you for talking to the students about it. Thank you for taking a serious look at it. Um, and thank you for um, looking at the gendered language around the dress code. Um, and I encourage you to look at gendered language around all aspects. There's very few um, instances where uh, one needs to use gendered language at all. Um, uh, uh, C piece, um, I just wanted to say when you were talking about the calendar and everything, um, one of the uh, subcommittee goals was actually to work with students um, from different cultural clubs and groups throughout the district um, and different community groups throughout the district to create sort of an advisory calendar to present to the board um, each year that would have not only uh, religious and cultural observances, but the cultural practices of those observances. So for example, if a holiday starts the night before, um, or uh, if that's a holiday that people go to school and, and eat, or if it's a holiday that you know students would be taking off for, et cetera, et cetera, um, because we don't always all know each other's cultural observance. Um, and that was one of the goals of one of, uh, or on the subcommittee that I was on um, in CP. As for the health curriculum, first of all, I just wanna say thank you. Um, second of all, I mean, not thank you. I mean, you guys haven't, you know, it's, it's mandated, but um, I would hope and assume that Cherry Hill, which is on the forefront of education, would also be on the forefront of this. Um, back in the 90s, I had pretty explicit sex education in Cherry Hill Public School District um, as part of the health curriculum. But just like the history curriculum I, I learned in the 90s, um, things have to be updated and uh, in line with best practices and understanding of today. And um, there is nothing different about the health curriculum. Um, uh, we are, um, I'm a parent advocate. I think parents are very important in the cultural, uh, in order to, I mean, in the uh, educational sphere, but parents are not experts on everything. Um, and where will we be in 15 to 20 years if we continue down the excellent path we're down? We will be a stronger and healthier district and hopefully world and putting our children out into a better world. Thank you. Thank you. We will uh, remain with the line. We have Alana Yaris. Alana Yaris, Cherry Hill. Um, I just want to talk about a few things that were mentioned uh, for discussion earlier in the meeting. Um, there was mention of possibly doing graduation alternating times each year. 
Um, just thinking down the line for my own children, um, if that were the case, then uh, it would be the same graduating time for all of them every year that they graduate. Um, I would hope that maybe the board and district can look into uh, alternating every two years so that if um, people have students that are graduating, um, it's a possibility that the graduation times would be different than all always being the same. Um, I was going to speak about hopefully the district considering giving off for aid. So I'm glad a student spoke about that and that uh, there will be town hall meetings for students, the Muslim society at the high school to discuss that. Um, I want to make sure that all the policies are looked at for gender neutral language uh, based on the society and world we live in today. Um, it is my understanding that Lunar New Year is a Wednesday in 2025. I believe you were talking about the calendar 2024, 2025, January 29th, 2025. I just wanna make sure that day is off on the calendar or listed as a professional development day. However, the policy is um, and make sure that is listed as a day off for students as the policy reads. Um, before the pandemic, board meetings used to start for the public about 7 p.m. Then because of the pandemic, it was transitioned to start at 6 p.m. Now the meetings are at 6.30. We are slowly reaching an endemic stage of this pandemic. And I was hoping that the meetings would hopefully be able to go back to starting at 7 p.m. Um, being the beginning of May, the holiday list for New Jersey will soon be approved. Please uh, do your diligence to check that out um, so that beginning of school year activities such as back to school nights are not scheduled on nights that would prohibit um, stu uh, members of the public to be able to attend. attend. And finally, um, I understand we're doing elementary school redistricting there is a family that I am aware of that lives in Surrey Place East, which is zoned for Sharp, that has registered their child for kindergarten for this coming year. And Sharp is already full in their kindergarten class. And it seems that Cooper, Stockton, and Hart are also full. So they were zoned and registered for Woodcrest. So please make sure you look into that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone from the um, in-person audience? Uh, okay, we'll return to the line with Nicole Nance. Uh, yes, good evening, uh, board. I just wanted to say that my comment tonight entails the updated New Jersey sexual sorry, education. Uh, Ms. Ms. Nance, we just want you to start with your full name and municipality, please. Oh, sorry, Nicole Nance, Cherry Hill. My comment tonight entails the updated New Jersey sexual education curriculum beginning this fall. Parents do not co-parent with the government. Any cultural or sexuality related conversations are the sole domain of parents and not schools. As of this coming fall, the schools will be introducing child pornography curricula to all Cherry Hill students as early as kindergarten. It will be in every subject, in every grade level, and in every book. The Cherry Hill Library has already 96 books on transgender topics. Surprisingly, books on traditional family values are limited. I call on all Cherry Hill parents to wake up and guard your children's innocence from sexual exploitation by the updated New Jersey State Sexual Education Curriculum. You will have no chance of opting out since that new sexuality curriculum is infused to every lesson and every subject. I call upon this Board of Education to delay implementation of the new sexuality education curriculum and to ban any books that have the new pornographic content. I call on this board to ban immediately the AMAZE program that shows pornography to our students. I call on this board to ban any conversation with children about sexuality without the presence of a parent. I call on this board to ban the relations of this school district with the Garden State Equality Organization that developed this pornographic curriculum. The only way to restore child safety from sexual grooming and academic excellence in our schools is for parents to remove your children from schools 
and for taxpayers to stop funding these failing schools. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't have anyone on deck. I'll give it a moment. Gentlemen in the room, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, Yoni Irish and Cherry Hill, I debated about speaking, but having two prior speakers attack an organization, Garden State Equality, where I am fortunate, where I am very good friends with the founder, someone who I admire, is inappropriate. Um, I was very much admirable of Ben Gopal, who is the chair of the Education Committee, who willed this as gavel to take down much of the speech that bordered on the line of hate, most likely just severe bias. Um, so my hope is the board puts a zero tolerance. Since yes, we can disagree about opinions, but as uh, one of our uh, esteemed leaders in the community likes to say, we can disagree, but don't be disagreeable. Um, and I believe we're on that borderline right now. Um, it's very sad and disheartening to hear that um, change is hard. Um, it takes time, but we have students in our community who identify as not just our traditional values, as we, some would say, of male and female. We now understand a lot more about that. In addition, when I was a student in this district, we had a massive suicide pandemic in our community, and I fear that could ever come back. And the way parents have been speaking in our community, it makes me feel like that our community is no longer welcoming to students who may not identify in the traditional sense that people look at it these days. I think it's important for the board to ensure that all students feel welcome. As we often say that we are here for the students, um, we need to make sure that we really say it a lot. We often fear those of us in public leadership that it's hard to speak up for fear of starting a flame. Um, I think it's too late and now it's more important for us to speak out about it and call it out and name it when it does happen and take the leadership from the beginning and not let the others control the conversation and say that this is what we do as a community. Thank you. Thank you. That will close our public comment number two section and I will turn it over to Dr. Milaj for his comments and responses to items raised during uh, public comment. Thank you, Mr. Ovadia. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, there was a, a, a theme that came through in, in some of the comments this evening. Uh, we talked a little bit about the new uh, health curriculum uh, and the standards that have shifted and the review by the Department of Ed uh, and the work that will go on in the district. Again, Cherry Hill has not yet revised our curriculum. Um, we have looked at the standards. We have had discussion about the standards, a curriculum committee involving expert practitioners, the teachers that we have in our buildings will be impaneled and they will review and uh, they'll present information. Like I said, I expect an update in August at the CNI committee meeting. And then probably at the end of August uh, is when we'll have full and more uh, completed information for the board and ultimately that will go out to parents. Um, if there are questions that people have specifically about the standards, again, I encourage you to reach out to the state board, uh, to the Department of Ed, uh, always a good place for you to go. Now, the school district does not distribute pornography. Uh, that's not part of what we do. Uh, assigning a, a definition from the outside, not being involved, uh, is not fair to any of our staff members uh, or to any of our students or to any of the materials that are being used. Uh, and I'm not saying even that the materials that were mentioned by folks tonight are ones that are even used in Cherry Hill. Uh, but a number of times it was mentioned about Cherry Hill distributing pornography to children. Uh, we do not distribute, nor will we be distributing pornography um, to our students. Uh, there's also a number of comments about equity uh, and about diversity. Um, I will tell you one of the best parts about living for me and, and working in Cherry Hill uh, and being part of this school district uh, is the incredible diversity that's here. Uh, as a community, we are getting better about being inclusive about the diversity. Um, there are more than 70 languages spoken in our homes. Um, there are families that are from all over the, all over the world uh, and families that have lived here for decades and decades and decades. Um, there are what would be considered or what at one time would be considered non-traditional families, um, which I would tell you really isn't even an acceptable term anymore, right? A family does not need to be defined in what people are saying uh, are traditional terms. Uh, we have children in our district uh, who identify um, as boys and as girls and as, as non-binary um, for to the, the gender that they were assigned at birth um, and to the gender that they feel that they are. We will continue to support those students and those families that are in Cherry Hill. Uh, it's who we are. Uh, this school district, this Board of Education adopted an anti-racist policy uh, nearly two years ago. Uh, it was about the district taking action and not just sitting back and listening and sitting back and watching, but taking action and being overt in our efforts to make sure that the diverse members of our community, all members of our community feel that they are included and they are a part and accepted part of what goes on. That's all of our responsibilities. That's the responsibility of the members of the Board of Education and the administrators 
our staff members, and honestly, the people of Cherry Hill. And we will continue to do that. We will continue to lead that. I'd be happy with any of the speakers tonight. If you want to sit down and have a discussion about what diversity and equity mean, be happy to have that discussion with you. Because honestly, based on some of the comments that were made, I don't think some of you understand what the word means or what the application of it is to a school district. But reach out to Mrs. Cohen. She'd be more than happy to schedule it. You know where to find me. You know where I am. Uh, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to sit down and to do that. Uh, I think that's about it. <coughs> Yep, I think that's it. Thank you, Mr. Vadia. Thank you, Dr. Malash. At this time, it is necessary for the board to return to executive session to discuss student matters that cannot be discussed during the open session. No action will be taken following the executive session. We will not be coming back into public session. Um, do uh, I do make a motion that we recess for five minutes uh, for a bio break and then go back into executive session. Do I have a second? Mrs. Arroyo, all in favor? Right, that carries. I will see everyone in five minutes. Thank you. Okay.